24th select board meeting. Um, this meeting is going to be a little bit different because at seven o'clock we have an election with um, a, a joint election with the library trustees to fill a vacancy on that board. So that will start at seven o'clock, but we do have other things to do before then. Um, so it's public comment period right now. At the moment, no one is here, but I am expecting some folks to show up. This is them right now. So we'll start with public comment since our public commenters are here. <laughs> you give me a hello. Huh? That's right. <laughs> So uh, please sit down and introduce yourself for the folks at home. Welcome. Well, hello, everyone. I'm Terry Rooney, chair of the Amherst Public Arts Commission. And I'd like to share with you the um, progress and invite you to the opening of the next Amherst Biennial which will be opening on October 6th, Art in Expected and Unexpected Places, as we did last time. What is so wonderful about this biennial is that it's bigger and better. We have five museums, four galleries, three colleges, and I'd like to thank Jim Wald for helping us get Hampshire College uh, he worked as an intermediary, and um, I've gotten a firm confirmation today from the president of the college, Jonathan Lash, that um, they will be hosting the White House Project, the um, installation that we did with Emily Dickinson earlier. Uh, we're hoping to install it at the entrance, which I think would be quite dramatic. Uh, and this is just one of 20 sites for this next biennial. Uh, we will be having art in the Eric Carle Museum. They've given us a beautiful space at the front entrance. And uh, they will be opening the museum for free for all comers on November 1st during the Arts Walk. And I believe that this is the first time that this will be hap happening. Another uh, site um, also for the first time is the Hitchcock Center, which is also celebrating a big birthday. It's going to be their 50th anniversary. And we will be having uh, some installation artists, uh, Nancy Winship Milliken, who did the sales that were on the two farms last year, will be doing an installation, uh, of course, with the approval of the Conservation Committee of um, making uh, bricks out of local clay, straw, and sand. She's going to be teaching a class at the Hitchcock Center and having her students make her bricks with her. And uh, these uh, bricks will be making figures that um, are farmers in uh, chores that seem to be disappearing in our mechanized age. Uh, for instance, farmers milking their cows, spreading seeds, gathering eggs. Um, Another site, um, well, we are so happy to have the colleges on board. And uh, University of Massachusetts, uh, we've been working with the uh, director, Loretta Yarlow, who was also one of my co-curators, as well as Elizabeth Barker from the Mead Art Museum at Amherst College. At University Museum, uh, we, uh, they held over the banner project at the front of the Fine Arts Center, which has given it a beautiful splash of color to that building. Uh, we also will be having a performance artist uh, who will start at the pond uh, of uh, the Fine Arts Center. Uh, the artist is Samuel Rowlett, and he believes that the journey of an explorer and an artist are tied in the exploration of art or land or whatever. So he will be um, attaching, and this is a continuing performance that he has done throughout the region, of an eight foot blank canvas on his back, uh, eight foot by six foot, and he will walk from UMass to Amherst College to link the two campuses, and will be walking through uh, downtown with this canvas on his back. And I uh, presume probably interacting with the artworks around town on his way. So that will be on the, uh, during the opening celebration on October 6th. 
Um, we're also doing a very special installation at the Jones Library. Uh, we have worked out with the uh, uh, maintenance uh, manager uh, a way to install this, um, how can I explain it? It's a flying it's door, a flying door. <laughs> which uh, I thought was a wonderful <laughs> symbolism of like the door of knowledge or whatnot. Uh, but it sort of continues playing on um, art in unexpected places. Uh, we, one of the, m the most exciting things for me, last week I got Hampshire College, but also we got an empty storefront, brand new. We got the storefront in the LEED building behind Judy's, and they want us to run it as a business, and so we will be open on weekends and run it as a gallery. And what we will also do is, I mean, part of the biennial is to help um, artists um, with, you know, income and exposure and such. So we will be um, selling 2D work in, in racks and have a display there. But um, I think that this will become Amherst Biennial Central for um, this upcoming. <coughs> Um, another thing we're doing, we've been working with uh, John Musanti, the Design Review Board, uh, to uh, bring more art to Kendrick Park. Um, I have, when I was um, going to the meetings for the Kendrick Park, one of the things that the community brought forth is they would love a natural playground. And um, the curators have selected uh, these um, original uh, rabbits, uh, life-size rabbits that will be installed on rocks uh, so that children can climb up on the rocks and pet the bunnies. And, and it, um, it ties in and it's a, a wonderful homage to um, the author who wrote Uncle Wiggly. So um, this is just sort of a quick cross-section of um, what we're doing. Oh, well, well, let me also mention one special uh, place is uh, Amherst College. Um, we not only got the Frost Library Gallery, which we installed it this weekend, so you can get a sneak preview of the biennial there, uh, but we're going to have an artist in residency in the Stearns steeple in front of the Mead. The artist will be working most weekends uh, if it's uh, doing an installation using natural material. And if it's raining, she will be inside the Mead Museum <coughs> making watercolors, which will um, uh, be on display and or for sale there or someplace else in town. Terrific. Before I ask you uh, one question, I just want to make sure you folks are here for licenses, right? You're not here for public comment. Okay, go ahead. Okay. So uh, where should people go for more information about this? We have a website, uh, www.biennial.com. Uh, AmherstBiennial.com. Uh, I'm working with uh, Chris um, to uh, have a link. Um, that site should be starting, the town site will be linked to it. Uh, and we will also, uh, Bonnie has been working on a map. Do you want to talk a bit about this? Um, it's, um, hi, Bonnie Yesman, new on the Public Arts Committee. And uh, one of the projects we took on was getting a GIS map, which uh, was supported by Mike Olkin, and he's linking the sites with photos of the artwork which are going to be there. So it's a very nice interactive map which should be available, again, through links to AmherstBiennial.com. And just another thing to, to focus all eyes on Amherst because while many people think of Amherst as a really a forefront of educational institutions, when you start looking at all the museums that are here, it's really a fantastic place to see contemporary art. So this biennial, it just amplifies that even more. And I think the publicity that's going to come out of this will again draw a lot of attention to Amherst as an art site. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming in and uh, letting everyone know about this. So you said October 6th this October begins? October 6th through November 30th. October 6th through November 30th. And is there a particular kickoff time on the 6th? 5 to 8. All over town. Wonderful. The only site that will, there are two sites that won't be open that night. Uh, Eric Carl, as I said, will be open the first for free. They won't uh, be able to be open that evening. 
uh, and the Lord Jeff has three weddings that weekend, so they won't be um, open either. But this is another new first site. Um, I sent everybody on the select board a copy of the catalog, so um, feel enjoy. free to enjoy it. Okay. Thank Perfect. you very much for your Thank time. you very much. Thank you for coming in. My pleasure. Okay. Other folks here for public comment? Mr. Noonan, come forward and introduce yourself for folks at home. Good evening. I'm Kevin Noonan, uh, Executive Director of Craig Stores. Just wanted to take this opportunity to thank Diana for bringing it to the attention of the Select Board and the Select Board for your support and for John's reconsideration of the expansion of Craig Stores. We really appreciate it. And uh, it's a perfect example of how we, when we put our heads together, we can get get the job done. That's really all I came to say. So Great. I appreciate it very much. Thank you very much. Thanks Thank for coming you. in. Anyone else here for public comment? Okay, then we'll get a couple things done before our <coughs> 645 item. Um, one thing for select board. Um, we are scheduled to meet next Monday, October 1st, and I would like to propose that we not I know that would just break your heart. <laughs> um, and what I would like to do is ask for your consideration to pencil in October 29th. That is not a date that we're currently meeting, and I will try to not have us meet then. But um, because town meetings start so late and all the warrant deadlines, et cetera, are so late, we really don't have much to do, like nothing to do next Monday. Uh, it, October, our big jobs are dealing with uh, the warrant articles, taking positions on the warrant articles, and also dealing <coughs> with budget policy guidelines. Given the budget policy guidelines, there isn't much to talk about in advance of our October 11th meeting, the four boards meeting where uh, Mr. Pooler will be giving us the initial projections. So while we, I'm sure we could sit around and find something to talk about next Monday, uh, I don't think it's necessarily worth it. So if folks are good with it, uh, that would have our next meeting be October 15th. Are we too brokenhearted to do that, to not meet next Monday? <laughs> no. Okay, so, um, and, and are folks okay if we pencil in the 29th? Uh, I will try not to schedule anything then because that will have us meeting. I think it's like four, four Mondays in a row or something if we get that one. But just in case we need that because it's a little bit hard to predict the scheduling of the town meeting stuff at this point, um, I just want to have that in reserve. So, okay, thank you. Um, I will also note that at the next meeting on October 15th, I will propose to us that we consider, uh, actually I'll propose that we make a decision about um, starting town meeting at seven o'clock this time. Um, so people can be thinking about that. That's not a decision to make now, but I just wanted to put that out there because we're gonna be signing the warrant on the 22nd. So the warrant's going to need a time. Um, we have raised this issue before and have looked for some feedback uh, from TMCC. I'm not sure that they've gotten to that yet, but because town meeting starts so late this year, November 19th, which really gets us close into the, the holiday season and, and when folks' time will be really at a premium, this seems like a good time to give that a try. So we'll have that discussion on October 15th, but I did wanna kind of plant that seed with folks so that they know to think about that for then. Okay, um, so it's 644, which is essentially 645. Um, Folks here for a common victuallers license for the glazed donut shop. Is that you? Please come forward. And so this is for the glazed donut shop. So please uh, introduce yourself. Um, my name is Karen Rhodes. This is my husband, Nicholas Rhodes. And um, we are originally, I'm from Amherst. He's from Shrewsbury. We're Amherst High School graduates. Uh, we moved away for a bunch of years through education and whatnot. And um, we own the mini donut factory at the Holyoke Mall, which you may or may not be familiar with. Um, and now we are moving home and wanting to open a mom and pop full line donut shop in Amherst. And this is in the carriage shops in that mm -hmm. end space, right? Yeah, where the Verizon store used to be. Right, wonderful. And uh, when are you scheduled to open? Uh, well, <laughs> we had been hoping for the end of August. Um, <laughs> um, all the work should be completed by the end of this week or beginning of next week, so as soon as the inspections can be scheduled, we'll be up and running. Um, so hopefully the end of next week, maybe the beginning of the week after. Wonderful. Um, of course. 
So uh, you come to us for a common victuallers license, which we essentially grant as a matter of course, but we have you come in just so that you can do a little commercial for your new business to the, to the folks of the community so that they know what to expect. So uh, anything else that you'd like to tell um, people about? Yeah, well, just we're planning on doing, it's, it's going to be a gourmet donut shop, so not just your run-of-the-mill um, powdered or cinnamon sugar donuts, but really high-end gourmet um, toasted sesame, orange ginger, um, Butterfinger, like really sort of like the fancy cupcake shops, but on donuts instead of cupcakes. We're also going to be carrying a uh, line of gluten-free baked goods, uh, which we're still working out the details because my, my family is celiac or, or gluten intolerant, and my standards are very high for what's acceptable if I have to like it or it's no good. So, <laughs> so um, at this point, we've got popovers and some muffins, um, and we are working very hard to develop a gluten-free donut, but it turns out to be exceedingly difficult to get it just right. Um, so we're hoping that that sort of that there's a need for that in this town to have a wider variety of gluten-free baked goods, and we're hoping to fill that need as well. Terrific. Any questions or comments for these folks? Ms. Brewer. I was just going to say if people had seen their adorable setup at the block party, they had wonderful, lots and lots of little tiny cute little donuts there. It was a really good setup and a really good way of spreading the word. So Thank you. my son's totally excited Thank waiting you. for Yeah, we, <laughs> we got a very warm reception at the block party. It was very, very nice. Great. Other questions or comments? Ms. Stein, would you like to make a motion? Sure. I move that the select board approve a common victuallers license for Karen Rhodes doing business as Blaze Donut Shop at 233 North Pleasant Street, Suite 43, Monday through Sunday from 5.30 a.m. to 5.30 p.m., Karen Rhodes, owner slash manager, pending issuance until any slash all outstanding town department regulations have been satisfied. Second. Further discussion, Mr. Hayden. Welcome back. Thank you. <laughs> and further discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 And that's unanimous. Congratulations. Good luck. And Thank we look you. forward to your opening. Keep an eye out for the sign. Indeed. <laughs> Take care. Thank you. All right. Next up, we have a lunch cart license for Paris Valley. Good evening. Thank you for coming in. And so your, your name is Paris Valley. Is that correct? Right. Great. And your business is Paris and Paris Ties. And ties. And this is going to be a lunch cart. Tell us a little bit about it. Right. Uh, it's actually, I just, I'm from Amherst, too. I grew up right here on Main Street, but I've been in New Hampshire. I married somebody up there, so we had a restaurant together. And then I got divorced, so I came back home. And I've been doing the food truck up in New Hampshire since 2003. So I've been here. Actually, I'm still doing it up there on fairs and stuff. But I would like to do something downtown here. Yeah. And what kinds of products do you offer? I do all barbecue. Mm -hmm. yeah. I smoke here in a unit. I smoke all the meats on there. Do like pulled pork sandwiches, baby back ribs, barbecue chicken, pretty much barbecue. Questions or comments? Ms. Stein. I just wonder if we could get them to raise the volume. Oh, That's certainly. Very fast. Yes, Amherst Media, if you could uh, increase the. Um, what do we call that? I always forget what we call it. Oh. Yeah, the sound from the speakers uh, in here, so, so that we have, so that we can hear ourselves, and that so other people in the room can hear us. So it's these uh, these speakers in this room, and I keep talking because that they, that helps Sorry. them <laughs> be able to keep louder, increasing yeah, it, right? So so, uh, so it will get there. So uh, thank you for pointing that out. Okay, um, so lunch cart licenses. This is something that we're kind of still in the process of figuring out exactly what our role is in in regard to them. Um, we have. Uh, the, the town regulations are a little bit unclear on them as far as what our role is, but we've been advised by town council if we want to be dealing with these in any great specifics, we should be dealing with the regulations themselves as opposed to kind of ad hoc uh, issues with each applicant. Um, that being said, does anybody have questions or comments about this license? Mr. Hayden. Maybe not about the license, but I'm wondering about the varieties of barbecue as, as some of us know, it comes uh, wide, wide variety. But, but right. what might you have? I mean, all my stuff is freshly made. You know, I smoke all the meat right in the unit on the day of the event. And I smoke at like really slow temperature. And I actually do really well. I do a lot of events in Merrimack, New Hampshire at the Budweiser plant. And I do a lot of small town fairs. 
and uh, I do well. And I think with the students here, I probably could do really well. Great. Other questions or comments? Ms. Stein, would you like to make the motion? I move that the select board approve a lunch cart license for parent Paris A. Valley doing business as Paris and Ties to operate within the public ways of the town center of Amherst MA from Thursday through Sunday from the hours of 11 a.m. to 8 p.m. pending issuance until any slash all outstanding town department regulations have been satisfied. Second. Further discussion, Mr. Hayden. Also, welcome back. Yes. Thank you. And further discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 And that is unanimous. And I had a question because yep. I know, like, uh, because I'm not new to this, a lot of towns they have areas that you could go. So I was wondering what the locations are here. We're really not that specific. That's part of the regulations <laughs> that we don't know about. Um, so. I think unless you get a complaint, you're probably going to be all set. Right, and I'm thinking in the long term, maybe I could find a space to rent. Great, great. But well, I want to make sure everything's okay before I look into it. Right. Well, good luck to you. Look forward to your business starting up. When will folks be able to expect to start seeing you around? Well, I'm ready to go. I'm actually in business fully. Every weekend I'm up in New Hampshire somewhere, so... Hopefully next week sometime. Okay. Just been waiting for this. Great. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank, Thank you for you. coming in. All right. Uh, the next two are pledge of licenses for uh, High Horse. Uh, DBA is High Horse Brewery and Elephants of Mercy DBA is Moan and Dove. We had talked in the spring, and I know this because I've been working on the Select Board Annual Report, which sneak preview for untimed items is not done yet, but it's getting closer, closer, closer. <laughs> um, we had decided in the spring that for um, licenses, uh, liquor license changes that were technicalities, essentially things that didn't require a public hearing, that we wouldn't actually require the people to come in and uh, I hadn't actually remembered that at the time the agenda was made. Um, so I don't think the people are necessarily coming in for this because that is consistent with what we have um, been saying about that. So what this is is uh, when folks own a business, um, they can, if they have a liquor license, they can use that as collateral essentially it towards their borrowing with a bank. And uh, that is what this is all about. Um, we asked town council about this. Uh, places, we're always trying to learn more about the things that we sort of treat as technicalities <coughs> to make sure, are they really technicalities? What other things should we be considering in regards to this? And um, essentially places treat these as technicalities. There's, uh, if we were to deny it, it's possible that the borrowing could be denied, um, but there's no real reason to deny it because the, uh, the they're there would be other issues related to the borrowing anyway. What it does, uh, what is clear though, is if this person, if any person who was in a situation like this pledging their <coughs> liquor license, if they were to lose their license as part of the loan, we still maintain control of it. So that's really kind of the bottom line that's interesting to us. Even if it were to go to someone else, it would still need our approval to be operate in this town. These are all just fill-in details, have nothing to do with the, uh, the specifics or the likelihood of default or anything like that on these applications in front of us. It's just um, we somewhat recently, uh, last spring, I think, had a, had a pledge of license also. And at that time, we sort of said, oh, let's try and learn more about these for this time. And I think that's everything I know in a nutshell. Questions or comments about this, <laughs> this pledge of license? Mr. Hayden. You've touched on, on the high points. I appreciate that. I wanted to just, just also offer an appreciation for the, the miniature treatise that we got from, um, from our attorneys, just helping us sort of pick through case law and get to the same high points that you mentioned. Um, uh, we're not going to deal with it tonight in any great length, and that's kind of unfortunate. Our viewers at home don't know that we had that on our desk for a couple of days to try to figure it out. Um, I, and maybe I would just reiterate one point, and that is that the pledge doesn't allow, it doesn't somehow or other change the, our responsibility for accepting or denying or continuing or discontinuing a license. So we don't lose maybe the most important thing that we have regarding a license. Exactly, and that is the, the key point. It's an interesting thing. I, I don't know why this would be worthwhile to the bank to have in this way, but 
That is not our problem. Um, <laughs> Ms. Stein, would you like to make the first motion? Sure. I move that the select board approve the petition for change of an existing all alcoholic restaurant license relative to ABCC license number 12-0024-0012, High Horse LLC, doing business as High Horse Brew 240012, High Horse LLC, doing business as High Horse Brewery and Bistro at 24 North Pleasant Street, Amherst, to include the pledge of license in the amount of $54,000 and no cents to People's Bank in Holyoke, MA, at the rate of 3.99% for a term of five years. Second. Further discussion, Mr. Hayden. I'm delighted to do anything to help out. I've had a number of wonderful brews there, so. Very good. Any other questions or comments? Uh, then all in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. Next one. I move that the select board approve the petition for for change of an existing all alcoholic restaurant license relative to ABCC license number 12-0024-00053, Elephants of Mercy LLC doing business as Moan and Dove at 460 West Street Amherst to include the pledge of license in the amount of $54,000 and no cents to People's Bank in Holyoke, MA, at the rate of 3.99% for a term of five years. Second. Further discussion, Mr. Hayden. Uh, another fine establishment with a completely different atmosphere from the high horse. So. Indeed. Further discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 And that is unanimous. All right. Coming up at 7 o'clock, we have an election that's still a few minutes away, and we don't have a candidate, so we will wait a couple minutes more. Uh, Unless, Mr. Hoffman, did you have a comment about that? Oh, okay. Um, so let us do a couple of untimed items. How about the parking and street closure requests? Stein. Okay. I move, so I'll just go ahead. Yes, please. Okay. I move that the select board approve the closure of Overlook Drive from house number 59 through 75 on Sunday, October 14th, 2012, from 11.30 a.m. to 5 p.m., for the annual High Point Hill Neighborhood Block Party. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. I move that the select board approve the reservation of one metered space in front of 31 Spring Street, Amherst, beginning Thursday, September 20th, 2012, through Friday, October 5th, 2012, at a fee of $5 per day per meter from Marnie Electric. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. I move that the select board approve the reservation of two metered spaces and the handicapped space and access aisle in the Kellogg Avenue lot for one day certain during the time period of September 26, 2012 through September 28, 2012, at a fee of $5 per day per meter for the Unitarian Church. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. How about taxi licenses? I move that the select board approve new taxi chauffeur licenses for Michael Diamond and Julia Mahoney, both of Amherst, on behalf of Taxi Express. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 I move that the select board approve new taxi slash chauffeur licenses for Edwino G. Gernandes of Amherst on behalf of Zuqui Taxi. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 I move that the select board approve a new taxi slash chauffeur license for Anne Marie Cloutier of South Deerfield on behalf of Celebrity Cab. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 I move that the select board approve the transfer of an existing 2012 taxi license for Edward Cage of Amherst from Zigley Taxi to Gotta Go Taxi Company. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. All right.
We've got candidate. We've got electors. We are ready. Okay, so at this time, I'll ask the library trustees to come forward and grab your seats. They are labeled. Um, and if Mr. Pam would come forward to this table, please. And I will just explain briefly what it is we're doing here. Um, when there is a vacancy on an elected board, a school committee, the library trustees, uh, redevelopment authority, things like that, the uh, Mass General Law, Chapter 41, chapter 41, Section 109, thank you, um, calls for Chapter 41, Section 11, actually. All right, we don't know the exact MGL reference. I believe it's 11, but at any rate, um, it, it specifies how we manage that. And the way we manage that is through a joint election of the uh, select board and the remaining people sitting on the board with the vacancy. Um, so that is what we are here to do tonight. We have talked about this in late August about setting this date, putting out a call for letters of interest to fill the seat. Um, the deadline for letters of interest was Thursday, September 20th, and we received one letter of interest, and we're so glad that you're interested. Um, we still need to have the election, even though it sort of seems like a technicality. It's not a technicality, and in fact, um, asking questions of the candidate, which we're not required to do, but we all have the opportunity to do, is a good way to help the candidate kind of get some feedback and, and some, um, some sense of, of what the uh, position is expecting and, um, and how he might serve. Um, I'll note that uh, there are a couple of things specified in state law about this. One of them is that the candidate requires the majority of seats of all those remaining uh, eligible officers. So there are, uh, the library trustees when fully constituted have six members, at this point they have five members. So the select board has five members, that means 10 people are eligible to vote all together, which means that six votes are needed for uh, the, the winning, uh, to win the seat. Um, and that is regardless of attendance. Um, so I'll note that one person is either absent or at least not here yet. You're not expecting Mr. Wolf. Okay, so Mr. Wolf will not be with us. So we still need six votes, even though um, even though one person is not here. Um, the other thing that it states in state law is that this the person filling this seat will serve until the next annual election. So this is not filling out the seat. If this if this seat, I don't, I can't, don't actually even know if this seat, no, this seat was just filled, I believe. Well, it doesn't make any difference. Um, whatever the term is on the seat, um, because everybody gets a three-year term, that uh, th this person would not inherit that same term. It, it only goes until the annual election. So assuming Mr. Pam uh, receives this seat this evening, um, if he wanted to run for the three-year term, he would, or to fill out the term, he would have to um, submit nomination papers, do the, the same process as is required for running for any town-wide seat. Okay, so before we get started, does anybody have any questions about any of that or about what the process is gonna be? Okay, so I s gave everyone a memo uh, last week and this is in the select board's packet that talks about how this is going to work. We have a process for how this works when there are more candidates. We only have one candidate, so it's much simpler. Um, but basically, um, Mr. Pam has the opportunity to make an opening statement of up to two minutes. We will then go, uh, we will alternate as practical between select board members and library trustees for asking questions of Mr. Pam and he has up to two minutes to answer each question. Uh, as I said, no one's required to ask a question, but that is your opportunity. Um, when we're done with the questioning, uh, he will have the opportunity to make up to a one minute closing statement and then we will have our vote. Mr. Hayden. Just a question of process. Um, does the chair of the library trustees need to convene his meeting? That's a good point, sure. People deal with that sort of differently, whether you formally or informally convene. Um, Mr. Sarrett, would you like to formally convene your meeting? Uh, having heard uh, Mr. Hayden's praise for various places of libation, I think uh, <laughs> <laughs> I should take his instructions. So uh, I'd like to call the meeting of the Library Board of Trustees to, to order. Uh, if there are any objections to that, please speak now or forever hold your peace. 
and that is so convened at 7.05. All right, so um, first we will introduce ourselves just so uh, Mr. Pam knows everyone he's dealing with, and I will start on my left, Mr. Sarah. I'm Austin Sarah Jones, Board of Trustees. Alyssa Brewer, Select Board. I am Stein, Select Board. <coughs> Stephanie O'Keefe, Select Board. Uh, John Misanti, Amherst Town Manager. Aaron Hayden, Select Board. Carl Erickson, Jones Trustee. Hamson Ely, Jones Trustee. Chris Hoffman, Jones Trustee. Thank you. Um, and if I could remind everyone at these tables to please try and speak into your mic because this is being broadcast by uh, Amherst Media. All right, Mr. Pam, welcome and uh, please uh, tell us about your interest in serving. Thank you. <coughs> I heard that there was a vacancy. I have uh, some experience and skills that I thought might be useful to the library board and consequently I put in some papers. The experience that I bring to this uh, involves um, many years of working for the New York City Controller's Office where I was involved with both reviewing um, actions that came before the city's board of estimate which at the time was the equivalent of a board of trustees for the city um, as well as spending some 15 years or so with the city pension funds, most of them as the director of contracting, portions of it as the, uh, the overall manager of, of the staff there. Um, during that period of time, uh, I've also been involved on a volunteer basis with a number of libraries uh, when I worked in New York City, I lived in Port Washington. While there, the, the library is an excellent library, but it had gone through a uh, period of some controversy. And in order to uh, recover from that, having had their budget voted down twice in a row and the uh, director uh, resign, uh, they decided that it was an appropriate time to get some additional community input. And they created a long-term planning advisory board. I served on that and we spent two years working through some of the issues that were um, necessary involving both physical plants, uh, priorities in terms of services, um, activities that needed to be done that were reasonably successful. Uh, the town approved not only the, the regular budget of the library and were uh, positive towards the new executive director, um, but also approved a, a major capital expansion of, of the library. Uh, subsequent to that, we lived in Norfolk, Connecticut, uh, which is a very small town of some 1,600 people. Um, but which has one of the, the better libraries in the country. It, you know, the libraries of the country have a rating system and the highest rating is five stars and this happened to be a five star library. Um, and my wife was the president of the uh, Friends of the Library for a couple of years and a member of that for a number of years beyond that. Uh, I was involved with that to the extent that seemed appropriate but uh, some of the things that you learn by spending a fair amount of time with librarians and doing some research and thinking about the, the issues involved may be helpful to um, Amherst and may be of use to the Board of Trustees. I understand this is a six month appointment. I don't look to um, direct anything here. What I hope to do is to make some contributions that may be of help. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, so uh, I will now alternate um, among select board members and library trustees, starting with library trustees, on questions. And uh, so Mr. Pam has up to two minutes to answer each question, and I will do the best I can to, um, to basically raise a finger when you have about 20 seconds left. Um, okay, so uh, I'll start with Mr. Serrett. Thank you very much. Before I uh, ask Mr. Pam a question, I'd, I'd like to express the gratitude of the Jones uh, Library Board for the great work that you've done in uh, dealing with this vacancy. Uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Mr. Pam, thanks for your, thanks for your interest. Uh, your credentials are uh, very, very impressive. I want to pose a hypothetical for you. Uh, you should feel free in the spirit of uh, most 
politicians to refuse to answer the hypothetical, I promise I will vote for you in any case. Uh, here's my hypothetical, uh, and I want you to treat it as a hypothetical. It is a hypothetical. Uh, a, a staff member of the library buttons hole, buttonholes a member of the trustees uh, while in the library and says that he or she uh, has some concerns about the performance of the director of the library. Uh, could you uh, work, me, work through with me how you might respond to such, a, such an approach if you were the trustee? Well, uh, <coughs> I, I'm not familiar with what is normally done at this library. The, the normal practice would be uh, first to make sure that they are going through whatever the standard pro process is uh, in terms of talking to their superior and going through the, the normal chain of command. Uh, if there is such an issue, I, un I know that there is a personnel committee of the board, and so I would think that the appropriate thing to do would be to bring this as a question to either the president or to the chair of that committee. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, select board members, Mr. Hayden. Yeah, I have a um, um, vision question, if, if you will. Uh, I'm hopeful on my account um, that you've delved into the tasks that the, the trustees that you hope to be joining for the next, it's more like eight months, um, that you've, you've seen or got an idea of what it is they're up to. Um, given your experience and your knowledge, and I appreciate you laying that out so quickly, in two-ish minutes or less, how are you going to help them? <clears throat> there are a couple of areas where I have some, I think, useful experience. Uh, one has to do with budgeting. Uh, is this working? It, it is for the television audience. Okay. Um, I've looked at, at the budget for this year. I've looked at the budget for last year. Um, there are things that I would think might be clearer. Uh, there are things that I would ask some questions about, and so that is one area that I think might, I might be of use. Um, as I said, I think some 15 years of my life have been spent with some of the best professionals that I know in investments, and so um, I know that there is an investment committee and there is an endowment, and so I would want to at least take a look at that and offer whatever uh, advice I might have that was useful. Uh, third, I have uh, spent some time looking at the, the Jones building, not so much the, the two branches, um, and there are clearly physical things that, that may be better used or um, be in better condition. And so um, if that was an area that, that uh, the board would like me to spend some time talking about, I'd be happy to do that. And fourth, uh, the, the central use of a library is its collections. And the collections are meant to be available to the public. And the question that arises there is, what is the, the current process for making decisions on those? This is not necessarily a board decision. This is more a, you know, a staff set of decisions. Um, but it would be something that I would like to understand better. And we'll go from there. Thank you. Thank you. Library trustee, raise your hand if you have a question. Mr. Erickson, and please speak into your mic. Thank yes, you. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> this is a short-term appointment. Um, I am r relatively new to the board myself. So I'm extraordinarily aware of how much information hits you and how long it takes you to get your feet on the ground. Have you given any thought to whether you would run next spring for a either a, a brand new term or the rest of this term or whatever it turns out to be? Have I given any thought? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that thought was? Um. During the six or eight months that I will be serving, um, I will discover whether or not the, the board finds it useful to have me there, and that will be a, a major con 
component of any decision that I make. Um, I would hope and expect that there will be other candidates who will uh, bring their names forward some six months from now. Uh, if they seem to be better suited to do the work, then I, I don't feel a necessity to run. This is not something that I've spent my life waiting for. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to vote against you. <laughs> <laughs> the select board member. <laughs> Mr. Wall. This has been very useful so far. Could you tell, uh, just as, a, as an outsider looking at things with a fresh eye, this may pick up part of your, your already the statement you just made. What do you see as the biggest challenges facing the Jones? There are, I don't have enough information to say what, what the challenges are with respect to um, members of the community knowing about services and to what extent they actually make use of those services. So I can't answer that, but that's clearly something that would be of some interest. Um, my impressions of the collection have been generally positive. Um, there have been times when I wished there was a book that I didn't find, but that's not really that unusual, and there is an interlibrary loan system, so you know that's not a, a critical issue. But um, the thought <coughs> comes that that there may be ways to improve on that. Um, I don't know on the business side of things whether there are efficiencies that could be created somewhere. And the fourth one, and the cl clear one, is. Uh, are the finances in such a state that, that they, the library can do what it needs to do. Thank you. Library trustee, Ms. Ewing. Um, I speak as a trustee, but also as a librarian. Um, libraries are a lot more than books and holdings. Um, while that's very important, um, there are so many programs and so many needs in the community. And I wondered if you had looked into any of any of the programs that Jones offers, if you had any familiarity with any of them? Uh, in the week since I heard there was a vacancy, <laughs> 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 I have done enormous amounts of research. <laughs> um, I ha let me put it this way. I am basically a, a government person, a, a scholar of government, if you will. I've spent 15 years teaching public service in one kind or another is bud and budgeting. Um, the one of the ways that I learn about things is I look at the bulletin boards, I, you know, I, I see what's going on, I you know, see what's listed as activities for the day. I've been doing that since we moved here two and a half years ago. So I'm a reasonably aware of, of some of those. I've been a participant in a number of those that, that involve children um, because I've got two grandchildren and we've been taking them to all of the things that one takes a child to. Um, there are an, an enormous number of services that I was familiar with in the pre two previous libraries that, that I've been involved with. So I am aware of the, the range of services that are potentially available and some familiarity with what is available here. Um, and that's about all I can tell you on okay. that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Select board members. Mm -hmm. All right. Ms. Stein. You mentioned um, that Norfolk, I think it is, has a five-star library. Yes. What would you think we need to bring the Jones to a five-star rating if if uh, there is such a thing for us. <laughs> um, I, I can't answer that. Okay. Sorry. Um, you know, the, the reasons that that library received that rating involved uh, its enormous importance to a town of that size. It was the community center. It was the place where people uh, came to gather on a regular basis um, movies were shown, uh, artworks were, were uh, uh, displayed. 
there was an enormous number of programs of all of the kinds that, that, that you know, we've, we're talking about. And yes, I'm aware that many of those things are done here. Um, this is a very different environment. Uh, the UMass, Amherst College, uh, Hampshire College, these, I would not call them competitors, but they, they are alternative uh, places where people can gather, and they do. So I don't know that, that the same kinds of approaches would work. Thank you. Library trustee, Mr. Hoffman. Okay. <coughs> I'm trying to decide between a softball and a um, trick question here, but I've got one <laughs> I like. Because <laughs> I'm the last trustee. Um, generally, you know, lately the budgets have been relatively good. We've had a few lean years. But let's assume that sometime while you're, well, I guess, <coughs> Potentially, you're only here for a few months, but if you were here longer, suppose the town said, it looks like the budget is really bad. You can really expect a lot less money from the town than you were think than you had planned on, the board library had planned on. What would be your approach in terms of increasing funding or looking at the budget to make cuts? How would you, um, what, what are your thoughts on that? Partially, the answer depends upon what kind of notice that you've got. I, you know, there are lots of ways to do fundraising, which may or may not be done currently. Um, you know, you know, I have been in, in towns where the amount of money which is provided by the town is very small. In Norfolk, it was $1,000 a year, and everything else came out of the endowment and the fundraising that was done on an annual basis. And, you know, that's not likely to be replicated here. And I hope it isn't, <laughs> just to go on record about that. Um, but nonetheless, you know, there was a, a much larger endowment. There was much greater effort being made to involve the town people, and the town people did not see many alternative ways of, of maintaining those services. Um, would I be supportive of Finding efficiencies, yes. Would I be supportive of cutting staff only if it made sense? And, you know, there, are, there are issues with everything. Thank you. Ms. Brewer, you passing? No, I can't think of anything more exciting. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so then I'll ask the final question. Um, so fundraising and advocacy on behalf of the library is a really big part of what the trustees do. Um, could you speak a bit about how you would uh, advocate for the Jones in this role? Well, I would hope that the, the Board of Selectmen would, would be supportive. Uh, and to the extent that I could provide information or uh, an approach that, that was reasonable to, to, to all of you, I would try to do that. Uh, beyond that, uh, there are any number of different kinds of activities that can be used for fundraising. Um, I don't know how far they are currently going on. I know that there is a uh, research now going on about alternatives and, and opportunities available in fundraising. And, and I, you know, since I don't know anything about what is happening on that, I can't comment on that. Um, if there is a way to increase the endowment or increase the yield of that endowment, I would want to, to look into that. Um, if there are ways to um, increase the number of people who are providing uh, voluntary support, you know, through the friends or through other mechanisms, I would want to do that. Um, there are some libraries which get specific grants for activities that they do. I don't know how much of that is going on, so I can't give anything specific about that. Um, but you know, in, in each of these areas, there are opportunities, and one, one should look at them. Okay, thank you. All right, everyone has had an opportunity to ask a question who wanted <coughs> to ask a question. And so now, uh, Mr. Pam, if you would like to make a closing statement of up to one minute. Well, um, I hope I have been reasonably clear. Um, I am better at advocating for some things than I am at myself, so um, I hope this does not disqualify me. 
Uh, there are, I think, important reasons for having a strong library in, in any town, but in particular in a town which has uh, the kind of interest <coughs> in intellectual uh, life as well as the entertainment that comes from uh, CDs, DVDs, um, books on tape, and all of the other forms of, of information sharing that occurs through a library, um, it is important that it be as strong and as available as possible. Thank you very much. All right, so the other thing that is <coughs> specified in Mass General Law is that this vote be by roll call. And so I am going to call on each member. Uh, again, I'm going to alternate. When I call your name, you'll state your choice. And your choice, you really only have two choices. Your choices are Mr. Pam or to abstain. So uh, when I call your name, please offer your choice. Mr. Serrett. Mr. Pam. Ms. Brewer. Mr. Pam. Uh, Mr. Hoffman. Mr. Pam. Ms. Stein. Mr. Pam. Ms. Ely. Mr. Pam. Mr. Hayden. Um, I'd like to offer an appreciation for Mr. Pam's very direct and, and useful answer, and I'd like to defer my vote to let a library trustee put it over the top. <laughs> There's one in every crowd, isn't there? Mr. Erickson. <laughs> Mr. Pam. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Hayden. Uh, Mr. Pam. Mr. Wald. Mr. Pam. Ms. O'Keefe is Mr. Pam, and you've unanimously won the election of this esteemed joint body. Thank you very much for participating in this. Thanks to all the library trustees and the select board for participating in this. As I said, it does sort of seem like a technicality, but at the same time, I think that this has led to a very interesting discussion, and I hope that it's helpful for you. Um, you will need to get sworn in by the town clerk before you can uh, take part in your duties as a library trustee, so do make sure that you do that. And uh, again, thank you very much for your town interest in serving. will be aware of this vote? <laughs> I'm sorry? The town clerk will be aware of yes, this Yes, we will make sure that she is. <laughs> thank you all. Uh, Mr. Hayden? I think the chair needs to uh, uh, adjourn his meeting now. <laughs> thank you. Mr. Sarah, would you like to adjourn your library trustee meeting? <laughs> if uh, not. Is there a motion uh, to adjourn <laughs> the library trustees meeting? So moved. So moved. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? <laughs> Rising vote. We're going to adjourn to one of the priorly, prior named establishments. <laughs> <laughs> in that or case, a uh, select board. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Library yeah. trustees adjourn at 727. Ms. Brewer has a question. So just um, in terms of our records, it, it definitely is Section 11. If we could somehow specify that when we did this vote, we did it because of the vacancy but caused by the resignation of yes, Emily yes, Lewis yes. under MGL, you know, somehow. So oh. it's in our minutes, right? Even though, even though you know, I'm we don't not have sure a motion what happened per se. Yeah, we don't need the motion. But we just need the vote. But somehow, I think but our but minutes should reflect those should that be incorporated. That's all. Correct. I'm not sure why that had a mistake in it, but we've been uh, referring correctly to this on the agenda and it's everywhere. That's else. referring to resignations. That's the, what the that notice section. of vacancy is a different section. The right. procedure to select the replacement is section 11. Exactly, but my okay. point is when the minutes are kept for this particular meeting, they will. They there is not a motion details. that for this particular item, I want the minutes to reflect that particular MGL and the fact that Emily Lewis resigned. Gotcha. That's all I'm asking. Gotcha. That the minutes reflect those facts that we all know, but you know. It doesn't have to be added to the minutes, John. I mean, to the motion. It's, it's not a, there is no motion. Those four right. minutes in there. I think we're, we're clear on this. Okay, moving right along. Okay. So. 720 item, it is now almost 730. Uh, we have public works issues. Mr. Mooring is here. Welcome. Hello. Good evening. So I'm here to talk about the Pelham Road Bridge. This is a project Mass Highway has been working on for quite a while. They've uh, finally agreed on what they want for easements from the neighbors, and uh, so uh, we're here to accept them. Actually, the first thing we have to do is the sewer commissioners, the sewer commissioners need to grant an easement to the project, and then the select board needs to accept that easement. The, um, in your packet, you should have a drawing of all the easements. There's a little easement down in the left corner that's yellow. 
should be yellow unless yours is black and white. Oh. That, that little yellow one is the one the sewer e sewer commissioners have to grant for the project. All right, so we're granting this and then we're accepting it as the select board. Is that right? Correct. <laughs> That's All handy. righty then. Um, I'm trying to think of some good hats you could put on for sewer commissioners and then. <laughs> 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 okay, so this is, this is taking care of a bunch of little teeny pieces that <coughs> have to happen in order for this bridge work to proceed. We do have a bunch of information about this in our packets as well as a nice color-coded map dealing with all our different easements. Um, so before Ms. Stein makes the motion, is everybody clear on what we're doing here? Okay, Ms. Stein, how about you make the sewer commissioner motion then? I want to make sure I've got the right one. Is that the first? Yes. Okay. I move that the select board grant a temporary construction easement, AM-TE-1, on land located on Pelham Street, as shown more particularly on the plan entitled, quote, plan of land, in the town of Amherst, Hampshire County, Massachusetts, Main Street and Pelham Road, altered and laid out by the town of Amherst, prepare, end quote, prepared by Surveying and Mapping Consultants, Inc., dated August 2012, to the town of Amherst for the Pelham Road Bridge Reconstruction Project. Second. For the discussion, Mr. Hayden. Just that this is, um, this looks like um, builds on the, uh, the work of town meeting or town meeting approvals for taking these easements we took was it last last fall last fall so i just want to point that out okay. other questions or comments all in favor say aye. aye 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 that's unanimous and so next what are we doing mr moore so we actually now need to accept this easement which you just granted and then some several other easements the school committee was asked to give some permanent easements and some temporary easements along the Fort River because the Fort River School actually abuts the river right here. So they granted two permanent easements and two temporary easements. And then we have two neighbors, Mr. Luddy and Goldstein, who have also been asked to grant easements. The Luddies are granting two permanent easements and three temporary easements. And then the Goldsteins are granting two per one, two temporary easements. One has a different name, but uh, they're, t they're two temporary easements. Um, the whole purpose of all of these is so there's enough r room to work on the slopes and uh, align the channel proper or protect the channel properly and actually work over the side of the, the right of way, which is actually very close to the bridge. It's a very narrow right of way. And then there's also a temporary uh, pedestrian bridge that'll be installed. And so a couple of these easements actually accommodate where the temporary pedestrian bridge will be. Great. Questions or comments for Mr. Mooring? Everyone knows what we're doing. Mr. Hayden. Yeah, sort of getting in front of it this time. Again, these, these additional easements I see are very familiar from, from town meeting. So, so. Yes. All right. Ms. Stein, would you like to make the motion? I move that the select board execute an order of taking and accept the permanent easements and temporary easements shown on the plan entitled, quote, Plan of Land in the Town of Amherst, Hampshire County, Massachusetts, Main Street and Pelham Road, altered and laid out by the Town of Amherst, end quote, prepared by Surveying and Mapping Consultants, Inc., dated August 2012, which easements are granted or acquired by the town for the Pelham Road Bridge Reconstruction Project as authorized by the vote taken under Article 12 of the November 9th, 2011 Special Town Meeting. Second. Further discussion? <coughs> All in favor say aye. 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 That is unanimous. Thank you. So Easy we actually have three, three packets that need signing. Okay. So the first one you sign the left side and the right side, and then the next one, next two, you just sign one page. Okay. Because remember, you're sewer commissioners and then you're select board. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> we'll mess it up. Can I borrow your pen? And would you like to give us the paving update while we're doing our signing? 
We yes, figured I since you're that. here, we could just uh, have you talk about um, what all the ongoing construction is around uh, town so folks know the status of things and what to expect and look forward to. So uh, just we got off to a late start with our paving contracts this year because of uh, some issues with the appropriations from the state and then there was some uh, delays in uh, getting the proper word back from the state that we could go ahead and proceed. So we were supposed to start this week paving. Uh, the con both contractors were delayed and they will start next week, next Monday. The uh, Sunderland Road, the one contractor has been doing some minor prep work there, but the recycling, in hot in place recycling pr uh, contract will be in next Monday to start that road. Uh, Cherry Lane and Lower Cottage Street will be reclaimed starting next week and we'll probably have the base paved by the end of the week. So it will no longer be a dirt road. Um, the top coat will probably go down a little later, maybe a week or so later. Town Hall lot will be paved the second week of October. The Gaylord sidewalk will be put in the third week of October. Uh, it looks like the third week of October will also be when they mill Lincoln Avenue. South Pleasant Street, University Drive, and North Pleasant Street will go shortly after Sunderland Road. And we don't have an exact schedule for when they'll, what order they're gonna go in, but Sunderland Road's the first road they'll do and then they'll go to one of the other four and they'll be done by the second, by the end of the second week of October. And that's as long as it doesn't rain. So it's supposed to rain this Wednesday, which may push us off one day mm -hmm. to start because the contractor's working other places. <coughs> so that's the annual paving contract. If you have any other questions, the Main Street project's still going on and Atkins is still going on. Questions or comments for Mr. Moore? Okay, Ms. Fine. Could I request that you put a sign next to where, um, if you're coming um, from South Hadley towards the circles, there's a sign that says Two Bay Road and people who don't know that 116 is uh, to the left at that point could end up very confused and I've had a number of people ask me about that. I would gladly do that if I could. If you could. I, I have no control over the signage and the intersection uh -huh. right now. It's the state controls what signs are going up and what signs will be put up. So I'll make a comment to them, but other okay. than that, I can't guarantee it. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Any other questions or comments for Mr. Moore? All right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. We are Almost done signing. Is this it? Yeah, there's more, there, I think. There there. Is. <coughs> okay. All right, so uh, while we finish these up, um, Mr. Musanti, would you like to start talking about the reallocation of CDBG funds on recommendation? Sign those and then we'll start with that. Uh, yes, thank you. And uh, you do have in your packet a memorandum to me from uh, Dave Zomack uh, on this issue. Uh, we had uh, some monies from our 2011 CDBG award that were originally uh, allocated for uh, property acquisition related to affordable housing, a parcel off of West Street. Uh, for a variety of reasons, that is not able to move forward. Uh, therefore, there's 205,000 of CDBG funds that are uh, subject to reallocation, and it's uh, per terms of the federal grant, uh, there are deadlines of the end of this calendar year to use those monies or they need to be returned. Uh, uh, to Washington. Uh, in anticipation of that, uh, the CDBG Advisory Committee, through our normal process, posted a public hearing and on August 23rd uh, heard presentations on, I believe, seven proposals for potential uh, reuse of those monies. Uh, the board uh, uh, determined, uh, you know, applicability to CDBG uh, uh, priorities uh, and identified uh, three top priority projects 
for recommended funding uh, to me that I want to share with you for whatever feedback uh, you can give me uh, before we move uh, as a town to proceed. Uh, the first uh, recommended project is uh, for $95,000, and that would go to replace windows and doors at an Amherst Housing Authority project, uh, the Gene Elder House at 9 Chestnut Court. Um, and this is a this is a accessibility uh, barrier removal uh, project. Um, second is uh, twenty thousand dollars to the Amherst Survival Center. Uh, would go to purchase a walk-in cooler freezer uh, at their new center. Uh, While well, they've done a marvelous job with fundraising and they're uh, poised to open their new building at the beginning of uh, 2013. Uh, this is another key piece of equipment uh, that uh, will serve the uh, uh, users of the survival center and is a most appropriate use of community development block grant money. Uh, the third item recommended for funding is a total of $90,000 and this would be to the town of Amherst uh, and this would go uh, uh, for uh, mitigating hazardous material removal and also demolition of the house and barn uh, at the Hawthorne property at 235 East Pleasant Street. Um, this uh, proposal, uh, as you know, that property was purchased by the town a couple of years ago uh, with the support of town meeting for three, uh, uh, three future uses, affordable housing on the front uh, frontage portion of the lot on East Pleasant Street, uh, preservation of open space uh, for a portion of the property, and then recreation uses uh, in the back. Uh, this allocation of 90,000 allows us to proceed, uh, get a step closer on the creation of uh, two affordable units on the front property. Uh, this house uh, 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 has gone through a demolition delay uh, process and then an extensive feasibility study to determine the feasibility of saving some or all of it uh, for historic preservation purposes uh, with the ultimate goal of reusing or, or building new uh, to create affordable units. Uh, town engaged uh, uh, consultant to study that potential reuse came back with some uh, estimates that are in the five to $600,000 range in terms of preserving and then restoring uh, into just two affordable housing units and um, a very high price tag, but certainly doable, but at a very high price tag. Um, I also asked the Historic Commission uh, to look at this issue and offer some uh, advice and recommendations. And uh, their memorandum uh, is attached to this uh, packet of information as well. And their basic conclusion was uh, that it wasn't uh, feasible uh, to salvage uh, the house and the barn in an affordable way. And the, really the bottom line to me in the end is uh, the goal here is to create affordable units um, and so by definition that needs to be done in an affordable way and this is a way for us to uh, 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 clean up that site and allow us to uh, uh, take action steps in calendar 13, we hope, uh, in the creation of two affordable units. Uh, you can anticipate, assuming this proceeds, uh, that there'll be a uh, Community Preservation Act proposal to solicit proposals for the a creation of two units uh, on that property. And we think that can be done at a substantially lower cost uh, per unit that will attract uh, multiple uh, potential uh, bidders on such a project, whereas the uh, price tag of, of uh, preserving and renovating and, and some building of new is just cost prohibitive. In, in terms of the agencies we've talked to who might normally have an interest in, in such an affordable housing project. It just wasn't seen as feasible. So uh, that's the basis of uh, the recommendations and we're ready to proceed and I wanted to give the select board the benefit of that. 
briefing before I proceed further. Thank you. So the memo, uh, as you mentioned, is in our packets and also includes uh, four projects that were presented that uh, are not being recommended to proceed. The, the seven projects were ranked in order of recommendation by Community Development Committee and the reasons for not proceeding with the other ones and for ranking them as, uh, as was done is included in the memo. Does anyone have any questions or comments for Mr. Musanti? Ms. Brewer. The reason that I had asked for some additional material to be placed on our desk tonight and to, up, to be uploaded to the packet was because I wanted to recognize the extra effort the, the <coughs> planning department had gone to and the members of the public who turned out for a public forum that was held on June 19th to discuss the results of the Coldham Architects study, the same material that's here, which is on the Hawthorne webpage, which as you all know, we spent a lot of time working on in the past. So I just wanted to make that connection for everybody to make it clear that it wasn't only at CDBG, only at Historical <laughs> Commission, there was also a whole other separate public forum that had been held outside of funding issues just to talk about, so that Bruce Colton could talk about what all they figured out, and Peter Jessup was there um, speaking a, a little bit for, you know, on his perspective, both from CPA and Habitat, et cetera, and it was, it was a well-attended meeting, and I think people, I think it's fair to say that people there um, accepted, you know, that that was the reality, that it was just going to be too expensive to do it that way, so. Thank you. That extra information was very helpful uh, and gave great context. Other questions or comments? Mr. Wald. Uh, just in that vein, in, in part because I chaired the original demolition hearing on that structure and then more recently attended a meeting with Mr. Musanti, Mr. Zomek, uh, Mr. Malloy, and uh, Mr. Jessup. You know, this was, this is, I think this is an example of how the process works properly. The demolition delay was imposed primarily as a sort of precautionary measure because there are no immediate plans to demolish anyway. And it was clear from the start that the building was in very tough shape. And uh, again, you know, people may say, why do you do this? So the answer is that you have to judge things based on their intrinsic, intrinsic significance, but also their degree of integrity. And as the report from the Historical Commission explains, the integrity of the building was compromised to begin with and would have been further compromised by the process of renovation and rehabilitation. And then it's about affordable housing. Uh, when you're talking about $600,000 for two units, you're approaching the median house price in Amherst anyway, so that's not affordable. And, and it's a question of priorities. And the goal here was affordable housing. So this was a very, uh, you know, not a, not a totally pleasant decision, but a necessary and sound one. And I think the process worked well. All the d all different parts played their, well role, their, their roles very well, the committee, CDBG, uh, the public, and so forth. Thank you very much. Um, and I'll note, Mr. H uh, Hayden, you could probably grab that other microphone from the table from the library trustees, and then you guys wouldn't have to share anymore. Okay, other questions? <laughs> other questions or comments about the recommendations for Mr. Musanti? Anyone before Ms. Brewer? No, okay, Ms. Brewer. Yeah, anyone before Ms. Brewer. Come on, she doesn't want to talk <laughs> again. Um, I, I want to make sure I don't misspeak since I just received this information today. But um, I had forwarded to the rest of you that I'd also just received today that it was the deadline for the next round of CDBG proposals in general. So this is reallocation of money that we weren't able to spend before, but the next round of money, which would include money for non-social service pro activities, which we can't call capital, we have to call non-social service activities. Um, and I do not see that any of the four items that were not recommended are in fact on that list. So this is not something that it looks like we'll be revisiting anytime soon. Whereas we may have made that assumption simply due to the timing. It does not appear to me that any of them are on the list of proposals for non-social service activities for 2013 money. But maybe as they get fleshed out you know, next round after that. <coughs> Other questions or comments? All right, this is about select board feedback to the town manager on these recommendations that have had a public hearing process, but um, if members of the public would like to comment, Ms. Greeny, come forward, please. Good evening, my name is Huilin Greeny. I just had a very quick question. Now, if the uh, funds gonna be spent to take down the buildings, is there any plan in the future to build affordable housing on the site after it's demolished? <coughs> Thank you. Ms. Musanti. Um, if uh, things go according to schedule, uh, you can expect the demolition to probably take place sometime during the month of November. Um, we have 
uh, had staff already begin looking at uh, preparing a uh, CPA funding request uh, in time for the uh, annual uh, CPA projects consideration, which would be uh, later this fall and over the winter uh, for possible action as early as the annual town meeting in May. Um, so I think it's quite likely you'll see a proposal that will be considered uh, for funding uh, for affordable housing purposes uh, by the CPA committee in this round. Thank you. Other questions or comments? All right, so uh, Mr. Musanti has brought these to us for our feedback, um, <coughs> our lack of feedback. Uh, suggests that oh, we're good with all of this. Ms. Brewer has given us more context, but uh, the memo lays out the rationale for all of this very clearly. Uh, does anybody want to speak to anything uh, other than support for Mr. Musanti moving forward? Mr. Hayden. Um, no, I would like to support it, but um, the, uh, the comment that I would make is that the material that we got, which included a transcript or minutes of the meetings, was very helpful for somebody who couldn't be there to understand what was, what was happening and sort of make it easier to take a decision. Thank you. And uh, I appreciate Mr. Wald's points very well about the, uh, the process. Uh, he was speaking sort of specifically to the demolition process, but really the whole process for this. Uh, it was quite sound, quite robust, and so thanks to all involved. Consider the feedback supportive. There you go. All right, next up we have uh, review and finalize FY13 performance goals. Okay, so at our last meeting, let me pull up my correct document. At our last meeting, we talked about the goals that we had been talking about all summer, um, and we had a couple of specific things to think about. We agreed at that meeting to think about goal number three, part B. Um, and that was about gathering information about strengths and weaknesses in municipal service delivery. Um, our discussion last time was around whether we were talking about uh, active or passive collection of such feedback and whether we were talking about kind of the quality of town services in general or the act of soliciting the feedback on them. Um, so. So we're all supposed to chew on that. So I have chewed on that. And um, this is something that I, I believe that I initiated this years ago. Years ago. Seems like so very long ago now. Um, <laughs> and, and I consider it to be uh, active feedback from the public about town service delivery. Some, something that you could answer the question um, how are you soliciting feedback from the public about municipal service delivery? But I seem to be the only one who feels strongly about that. So uh, unless other people have chewed on this and decided that is also an important goal, I think it's important to, um, to get rid of any ambiguity about this finally. So I'm willing to give it up if this is, if this is something that I sort of see in this way and, and nobody else does, then uh, that I'm perfectly fine with that because clarity is more important than anything. Um, so uh, that's where I am. But does any has anybody else decided that they feel strongly that uh, that being able to answer that question, mm -hmm. what actions are you taking in order to uh, increase feedback about municipal service delivery, that that is or is not an important uh, goal? Mr. Heaton. Well, <laughs> as I yeah, as I masticated on that, um, I, I I I don't have an answer directly. But um, I, maybe I would make a, a point that I, I, I tried to, to bring up last time, and that is that we do have, um, I was gonna say mechanisms, but really we have information that could be, could be used to indicate exactly that. Uh, so sort of back up a little bit, I mean, the reason for the question is that one of the most important things that a town does is deliver services. And so, you know, to determine or to gauge its success, you'd like to know how well it's, you know, delivering, um, and and so that is that is important, and valuable. The uh, on one hand, on the other hand, um, we have there are resources already in place that might be pulled together a little bit differently, and that maybe that's your question: is how to pull them together into something that we can gauge more. 
um, precisely. That's um, not my question. My question is, um, do we do we want to keep this as a goal? My question is, I if this is a goal, do, would we agree that, that it is then Mr. Musanti's problem to figure out <laughs> how we gauge and collect the information? Um, so, so at this point, the question is, we either agree that this is a goal that is important and is defined as what, what are you doing to collect public feedback on municipal service delivery, or we don't. So, so basically, you need to weigh in on whether you think that goal as defined as such, y you want to keep it or not. And I'm, I'm hearing that people aren't crazed about keeping it. Um, then the answer clearly is no unless we're much more clear about what it is that we're asking you to gather. Okay, Ms. Brewer. I feel like that comment's exactly the same one we had before, and instead of what I feel like is some progress, maybe because it reflects what I think, which is I totally agree with Ms. O'Keefe's um, statement that she made about what we are looking for. So I think we absolutely need to keep it as a goal, and I think it absolutely is not something that we currently gather in any fashion. Random letters that say, what about the stop sign? Did you do something about the stop sign? Are not what I'm looking for. What I'm looking for is something with, again, without prescribing what it is. It's not, we know it's not a suggestion box. We already had that conversation. But it's something that's saying, here's something I tried. In a particular department, we've had some concerns raised about X, Y, and Z, so we tried out this one way of gathering input. And it's not this whole huge thing for the entire town, every single department, blah, 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 blah. It's a way of looking at one of the many ways that we really interact perhaps directly with the public, something that perhaps has been a concern that hasn't been timely as well as it might have been or has been awkward at some point and to say, this is what we did to try and make this one work better. And that would be great. I'm not looking for a huge overall system. I'm looking for an attempt to measure something that we think is worth measuring that shows that we're doing better at something or that we have a way of addressing it if we aren't. You've expressed perfectly what I'm trying to say. Mr. Wall and Stein, Ms. Wall. Pretty much on the, on the same page, I agree with the chair's interpretation of the goal, which is progress beyond last time. I think that's clear now. <coughs> and I pretty much feel the same way Ms. Brewer does. I guess my only question would be, uh, the town manager has a lot of goals already. We have other things we're trying to accomplish. So I'd be a little bit hesitant about making it a, a, a major undertaking. Uh, so I think either if we, if we are clear that we understand it in a limited way as Ms. Brewer suggested, or if maybe we were to phrase it in such a way as to suggest, uh, I don't know, this, is, this doesn't get the whole thing. Uh, developing a plan for such or a preliminary phase. I mean, I, I would think the other, we're sometimes unclear about goals and sometimes unclear about what it means to fulfill them. So I would be just want to be very, very cautious about not making a, a large open-ended demand here that can't be realized. Okay. Ms. Stein. Um, this sort of came up in terms of um, human resources and maybe that's the way to do it for next time because we are in a state of change and there are a number of things that are going on and maybe that sort of input from the people involved um, might be useful. I'm thinking of people uh, not only um, like Deborah Radway, but um, Leslie Salisbury and maybe Kay's Logar because she has seen it before. I don't know quite how to mesh those two ideas, but that's a case where it did come up that we thought getting some input beyond um, what we had would be useful. So maybe that's the first place to look. I don't know. So I'm not sure what you're saying. Well, the idea that Alyssa put forth was that this kind of feedback would come from one particular area, and I'm saying that perhaps that area ought to be human resources. Okay, so so I think we're we're still not on the we're still not all talking so about the same thing. You're thinking of the town at large. And yeah. That. So okay. so I'm thinking very much in as far uh, in the line with what Miss Brewer was saying. So that you know, um, Mr. Musanti might put out to his department heads you know, find ways of, of uh, figuring out if the 
public is happy with what we're doing or so it and and I'm talking completely hypothetically here and not giving him a list of things to do but you know maybe one department the thing that they might do is they would call people they dealt with to follow up to see how things went or maybe somebody would send out a letter to you know everyone who passed through that department to see how things went or you know maybe it maybe it's a specific event or a specific you know something you know a, a point in time for which you're trying to get feedback about how the town did that. Um, the example I used last time is, you know, in kind of the corporate world, people say, okay, how are we doing? How do we do better? And they find ways of finding out from their customers. And as Mr. Walt said, you know, you could sort of do this in this like global town wide, how's the town doing everything it's doing, which I don't think is, is uh, that's not what my intention is with this, but it's just to say, okay, how do we as a town, how are we taking steps to try and find out how we're doing in the different ways? Not, not holistically, <coughs> but, but in general to show that, uh, or I said in general, but I, but I can even mean specifically, you know, that we have found ways to try and um, get a sense from the public for whom this whole operation is about serving, h how they're feeling about how we're all, you know, doing our jobs and by we all I really mean the the you know the departments of the town so you know if you had issues with with how your street was being maintained or something like that maybe there was some mechanism for for finding uh, for finding out how the public feels about that if you had issues about how your conservation trails were being maintained that there would be just some sort of a feedback mechanism um, but again nothing nothing global like we're talking about the the facilities plan or something like that just you know indicators that that you've you're trying anything to get feedback on municipal service delivery Ms. Brewer yeah I mean because uh, along those lines I really feel like although in so many ways uh, we are not a business yet at the same time we do have customers we serve and if we don't call this out as a specific thing as we're concerned about strengths and weaknesses I think we're not doing part of our job because we're not drawing attention to it I think everybody comes to work every day assuming that they're doing the very best they can but they know there must be ways of tweaking something that would work a little better for people somewhere so if they can come up and again uh, you know building on what Mrs. O'Keefe said individual departments would do different things it's not necessary and I'm not even saying every department I'm not expecting that he would come back saying every department did a project even just suggesting a way to start a place to start doing that so that it becomes part of our culture that it is an ongoing thing it's not a one time and done goal for me it's a, an ongoing part of our culture that that's something we try and figure out ways to appropriately measure not an MCAS measurement but to appropriately measure so Mr. Hayden and Ms. Stein since we're kind of on the fence here I, I think the the MCAS reference is, is apt um, what you measure is what you're going to get right. and um, if it's if it's a measurement of popularity okay um, if, on the other hand, it's a measurement of the percentage of roads that need resurfacing, the number of potholes, the percentage of potholes that are filled within, you know, one day of being reported or four days of being reported, these, these are more tangible parts of the service that I think <coughs> you're providing. Um, I'm not sure that um, <coughs> I, I'm not sure that that satisfaction clearly satisfaction is the object that they're satisfied with the services that our, our neighbors are satisfied with the services um, but um, that's such a uh, an intangible difficult thing to measure um, whereas uh, you know I'm still going to advocate at some level for um, paying attention to the the precise measurements that we already do have and maybe um, if there's a goal that it involves expanding on those um, uh, I mean, I am dissatisfied if I report a pothole today because it broke my radiator, even if it's repaired tomorrow. Whereas, sort of in the general satisfactory um, uh, 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 doing your work, in, in, the, in part of having the work of filling potholes done in a satisfactory manner, that's okay. Ms. Stein? I don't have much to add. My point, I guess, was reflecting the staff comment and that sort of thing and not looking to the public at large, but just sort of what was going on 
in town government. Um, so I think I'm torn about this one. I, I can't imagine what kind of a instrument would be used to, to allow the townspeople to put that kind of input in. It just seems a little bit, um, a little bit hard to fathom what it would be. Okay, so I think we dump it because <laughs> we need to, uh, you know, uh, five of us need to mm -hmm. um, rate him on the success of this next year. And if at least two of us aren't even thinking about this the same way that three of us are, then there's no point. Um, so um, I think that Mr. Musanti is hearing what we're saying. He is either saying, oh, thank goodness they got rid of that, or, <laughs> 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 or I don't know what. Um, and and sort of see what he does with it, um, but I don't think, since we're we're clearly not clear on this, uh, and and we've tried this for a couple of years now and not been clear on it, I think it's time to dump it and uh, and go forward with it just as being rephrased as um, basically it, it'll be three A that it will just be a sentence instead of having a, a an A as part of it. Mr. Waltz, is there is there a way? mentally or bureaucratically to file this for, as a reminder that we still want to return to it at some point, or? Sure, you mean as something to think about uh, next year? Right, or beyond, because it's something that we can help to think about along the way also, because it, you know, if we're imposing a goal, we should have some suggestions about how it could be achieved. Because okay. I think it's a worthy ad objective. It, we're just not ready to do it right now, apparently. Okay, all right, yep, I can make a note of that. All right, so we're gonna strike it. Any other comment on that? Okay, good, so that's three is done. Okay, so I believe that we were done with all of the other goals that are presented on our document. At the last meeting, we were presented with two goals from, um, uh, from the public and that we were also supposed to think about and um, make recommendations on tonight. So would anyone like to make recommendations on that? Ms. Stein. Well, um, I thought the goal of uh, searching for affordable housing was a good goal. I thought there were, I, I think I sent um, a comment to you by email after the meeting that that seemed like a worthwhile additional goal. I think it's something we work towards, um, but I still thought it might be useful for the town manager to sort of be looking um, for ways to increase affordable housing. We know we have tremendous concerns about um, if we fall below 10%, for example. So I think that that is a worthwhile goal. I don't, uh, the way it was written, and unfortunately I didn't bring it. Um, thank you, Alyssa. Um, I didn't feel that, um, that the subsections um, where it, it made specifics specific mentions of how to do that were worth including. I, th I thought the goal of looking for affordable, making Amherst a more affordable community was a good idea. Um, okay. Other comments? Ms. Brooks? Um, knowing that the answer is probably no because I didn't come up with specific wording. Um, again, I wasn't, fam I was not comfortable with the specific goals that were laid out here in terms of the uh, X number of units um, and the, the way of approaching UMass. But in the spirit of those things, I do think it would be quite reasonable given the uh, effort that we have all expended that we do throughout our community committee system that we do at town meeting. I was trying to think if there was a way to sort of parallel it to our goal eight have a similar, the same way we talk about green efforts, to talk about affordable housing so that it's a sort of a constant theme for us. Whereas we were very specific um, in, in the goal here for eight, it does not say go and build a solar farm on X property. And it doesn't say make sure you get at least 2.1 kilowatts by the end of next year or we'll give you a not satisfactory. What it does say is it's a, it's a constant sort of touchstone, and I think that we could do the same thing with the affordable housing concept as a start, at least. Perhaps it would get more specific at another time, but that would be something that would keep it in the forefront as a reminder to everyone that this is a really important town-wide goal, and 
all the things he already reports to us, frankly, associated with affordability would fit under it. It's not really asking for something new at this point. It's just asking for its continued focus. Okay. Mr. Wall. I could accept it in that way, too. I think the, uh, the original proposal, as Ms. Stein said, with all the specifics, is not something we need. And it is something we're doing. The town manager has spent a great deal of effort on the current shelter, as we all know. Uh, this is part of the master plan, as is the green uh, policy as a whole. So I think in the sense that Ms. Brewer described as a reminder of things that we're doing constantly, it's good. But I'd be wary of attaching too many specifics to it. Mr. Chamber, did you want to come up? Um, I was just going to uh, to, re to suggest, as, as uh, Mr. Walt hinted at, that the the language parallel the master plan goals that <coughs> we already have along those lines. You're saying you would want to make the language do that or that it already does? I would want to make the language resemble it a little bit more. And and, and, and sort of the, 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 you know, where we're going with you know, more general and sort of bigger ideas, I think is, is in, the right, in the right direction. Okay. Um, so I think I share the, the sense that everybody has expressed so far. Um, so my discomfort also is in the, the details of this um, because I think that in a lot of ways it was kind of getting out in front of the, um, the housing production plan and kind of the community-wide goals that are going to be um, determined and, um, and that we're collecting data on. Um, but I would be satisfied with the first paragraph of number one that reads the town manager shall help Amherst become a more affordable community with more housing being created that is safe decent and affordable he will initiate and advocate for new housing efforts and programs um, I might tweak that wording a little bit but I would I, I think that's I think as far as expressing a value of the community in the same way that we have with the green goal is a good one um, but the the specifics so ba basically, I would just get rid of everything after that um, because I think that the second one, that's a, that's a concept that falls under the first one. Um, so I didn't, I hadn't considered this option or else I might have come up with, with other words. Um, but I, I <coughs> think, how do people feel about that first one with potentially tweaked <coughs> words? Shall keep Amherst, shall help Amherst become a more affordable community. Um, Mr. McCanty, any thoughts about this as you hear us? Um, well, yeah, I think clarity on, uh, you're really talking about housing related uh, issues. Um, and, you know, it does express the value of the community as articulated in the master plan and elsewhere um, and has without it being an explicit select board goal. I'm not arguing against that, but um, you know, the movement on, on the shelter, the, uh, the uh, engagement of the consultant who's right in the middle of helping us create a housing production plan, uh, the tangible creation of affordable units on Long Meadow Drive, uh, 42 units at Olympia Oaks in development, uh, et cetera. Um, but, you know, I, I understand where you're going on the, with the analogy to the green being green. Um, and so then the specifics follow that kind of re restatement and, and articulation by the select board that it is a select board priority. You know, that, that provides greater uh, encouragement okay. to take meaningful steps. So I propose that, that we... Um, we accept the <coughs> other document, as we've talked about. Those goals are all set and dealing with the, the 3B thing that we talked about tonight. Um, and that we work <coughs> with the concept of that first part of number one. And even though I hate to drag this on longer, um, I'll bring back proposed wording for us to, I if it needs to be tweaked. I'd, and perhaps it doesn't, but I just, I hadn't been thinking about it as just sort of pulling that part of it out. Um, so I'm not, I gotta, I have to, continue to chew on a little bit um, those words if, if we're okay with that, Ms. Brewer. I, I appreciate your compulsion to chew on it a little longer. I would be fine with, it doesn't have to be perfect, I would be fine with just sticking with that unless Mr. Hayden is planning to provide you exact wording from the master plan. <laughs> I would suggest that we just go with it because uh, 
it's done. And be so done with it. It, it, as a concept, I think we're very much agreeing on the concept at the same time. When we think about how we parse all of these words because they become the words that then we're individually yeah. parsing in our evaluations next year. I just want to make sure that we're good with them from that perspective. So um, if you wouldn't mind that we <laughs> stretch this out a little. <laughs> okay. 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 A little oh, this thing. I suggest that you bring the complete set of goals with that intercalated, and then we can just vote it and be done with it. We'll have a nice even I 10. Pardon? Then we'll have a nice even 10 goals. And because um, I think Alyssa's right, I don't think you ought to chew and chew. I'd rather um, you had the time to finish your annual report and be <laughs> done with that, <laughs> <laughs> frankly. I just, because I don't think, I know, I think it's well worded. Uh, if I thought it, there was something dire, I would say so, but I, I just don't think. It's sort of like me in the minutes. You really don't need that comma there. <laughs> okay, um, I hear what you're saying. You're saying, Stephanie, let it go. Um, um, I just don't want this to come back to bite us next next summer when we're talking about it. So, um, can always so if change you don't mind. We can always change it next year yeah so will you bring us back a nice a final clean version <laughs> since i've kind of ruined mine um for fy 13 including this then yeah okay. so uh, okay. i think that it's clear it's not as though mr musanti has nothing to do in the meantime i mean he knows what the, <laughs> you know, the, the doesn't goals have to work on no anything <laughs> <laughs> the the intentions of the select yeah. board are very clear and the the goals are clear and just the fact that he doesn't have the memo in his hand is not right um doesn't change anything. Okay, Ms. Green. Waylene Greeny, uh, thank you very much for your uh, accepting the first part of the language. And I'm here to um, just to kind of ask you if you'll consider, given the housing needs are not equal, the housing shortage is not equal across the board even though affordable housing is the goal. But as you know, that there's an extreme shortage of housing for people who are chronically homeless. And last time when I was here, I was able to rattle off 16 people who were identified by the town of Amherst to be chronically homeless. So if you would allow me to just quickly, in 2005, uh, Ken Mazakowski who came to the select board asking because there was a homeless woman in our town and he was torn, did not know what to do. So that was seven years ago. And this past seven years, we had gone through three town managers. First, Ms. Barry Del Castello, then Mr. Larry Schaefer, and now Mr. John Musanti. So in three town managers of seven years in the past, this particular person, this woman who had prompt Mr. Um, Mosakowski to come to the select board to ask us to address the homeless issue. This person is still in the town of Amherst, is still homeless. So that's just to show you that this shortage is very severe. So I ask you to put in this priority in your language, understanding the housing shortage is not equal, the housing needs is not equal, so I would like to ask you to consider saying that the town manager should prioritize the housing shortage of residents and ensure that safe, decent, and affordable housing be available. Put that as part of your sentence, one that you would like to add. In other words, recognize the priority and the severe shortage in this matter that I would like to ask you to consider. Thank you very much. Okay, so I think we're good on what we're expecting next time, and hopefully that will be the last time we discuss the goals until the time for January. progress report before uh, next thing you know. Okay, good, thank you very much. Then, where are we? Town manager's report, Mr. Musanti. Thank you, I've got several things to update you on. First, uh, you know that on Friday, last Friday I announced uh, my approval of uh, 
expanding the uh, homeless, emergency homeless shelter at First Baptist Church by six uh, women-only beds uh, for the uh, shelter uh, uh, period that will be this November 1st through April 30th of next year. This increases the capacity at that shelter from 16 beds to 22 beds. I uh, very much appreciate uh, select board's uh, uh, discussion and feedback and the feedback of others. Uh, we've worked out uh, some building code and other issues uh, with the uh, uh, cooperation and coordination with uh, Pastor Moselle, uh, Jerry Gates, uh, Craig Stores, uh, 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 people, and uh, we're poised to uh, have the shelter open on November 1st and uh, serve more people in town. Uh, this winter I joined uh, uh, select board members O'Keefe, Brewer, and Stein last night at, at the First Baptist Church for an open house that uh, Mr. Noonan, Mr. Gates, and others hosted. We also had a couple representatives from the Housing and Sheltering Committee, and it was good to see uh, uh, the site again and get an, uh, another walk through uh, with some of the specific uh, improvements that will be made made for this season. So uh, at least to see where we are on that. Thank you very much. And uh, I'd like to thank the town manager for um, for uh, soliciting the select board's feedback at the last meeting. And I, I think we're really hearing us for um, what uh, what we were looking for from that to be the uh, the the greatest capacity that could be safely and practically accommodated, and uh, and I think that that went well. Um, I do have to say that um, I think we have to be very careful with this going forward, and and we think about the relationship with um, Craig's Doors. Um, Craig's Doors is and doing a fabulous job running the shelter for us. And uh, this has been a great year and we're looking forward to another great year. Um, that whole process got very uncomfortable. However, I think that as a vendor of the town, as, as a, an organization that's holding a, a very uh, pricey contract for the town services, once that turned into an active lobbying effort by that organization kind of against the town, that was a very peculiar situation to get into, and that was really, um, that was a very non-professional way of handling that. And I think that when we think about partnering in the region, when we think about what it means, when we talk about dealing with these issues regionally, uh, it's very important to the other service providers to know that Amherst's representatives, the folks that we're doing business with, the folks that are on the front lines of Amherst's response to homelessness, are um, good and professional partners in that kind of effort. And I think it's going to be very um, concerning to the other folks that we need to be dealing with regionally if they need to worry about being in a situation where once you start disagreeing on things, it becomes a s like a strange public lobbying effort. So um, I just wanted to kind of let folks know that the, this whole expansion thing, in my opinion, very much happened um, despite the lobbying effort and not because of what we had was, was facts and information to deal with. Um, and th then the rest of it uh, made things unnecessarily complicated and, and I think could be damaging in the long term. So I, I just I just needed to get that out there. Questions or comments from Ms. Musnick here, myself, Ms. Brewer? I was just going to say I said something not that eloquent, but to that effect to the Housing and Sheltering Committee because, again, reminding us that it's a fairly new committee. It, you know, it, it came together. It only has a couple of people on it that have been through these issues for a long time. A lot of the people are not familiar with town politics, and they were, un they were you know, having a hard time understanding where do they fit into this because, obviously, they have some opinions on sheltering role, but we also know that they're not managing the shelter in any fashion, and how can they effectively provide feedback, and we did see a memo come from their co-chair who has um, Mike Giles, who unfortunately has had to step down due to other responsibilities, but um, but that was his last thing that he was able to send us. I um, do not mean to sound mean, but um, it was, I thought it was very unfortunate at the block party 
to have people feel that an appropriate way of going about doing this was to ask people to sign serve uh, to sign petitions for eight more beds. I thought that was not something we would do in any of our other types of dealings with other vendors in town, and I thought perhaps it led people to. I don't know why they did that. I know they wore the stickers. I don't like petitions. I think petitions are generally not the way you get things done, and I would definitely say that I agree that this happened in spite of those efforts, not at all because of those efforts. Those efforts did not help this situation at all. What helped this situation was people working through channels and working through the necessary process and all the necessary steps that needed to take place. So, Thank you. So I, I just think it's important, you know, th this is, we're all, we're all uh, kind of learning as we go along here, and I think that this is maybe kind of just an important point in the development of, of Craig's Doors as a vendor and how they're working with the town and how they'll be working with other organizations on behalf of the town to, uh, to just um, kind of be thinking about this from kind of a more professional organization standpoint and not just as, uh, as advocates because people, it's going to be very difficult to partner as we need to do regionally with folks if they are going to worry that they're going to be kind of lobbied against in that partnership. That's not really how these things work. So, all right, other questions or comments about this? Well, I just don't happen to agree with that take on things, so I have to say that. Um, I really think that whether we allowed expansion of the homeless shelter was of great interest to members of the community, and I think the amount of email that we got favoring an expansion indicates that it was a policy decision that really mattered to a lot of people in town, especially when they thought it wasn't going to happen. Um, they recognized the need, and I don't believe for a moment it's going to impact our regionalization efforts because I think Northampton has been doing things for a while with um, various kinds of um, um, establishments, shall I say, like this. And I don't see that we would be less apt to, to undertake a regionalization effort with them because they have done something prior to the regionalization effort. I mean, we we both had health departments before we decided to go together on a regionalization. One didn't preclude the other. So, um, but I don't think we need to carry the discussion on any further. I just think we have to be very careful how to distinguish what could be perceived as policy from what is just dealing with a vendor. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna move on now. Next up, Richard. Okay, uh, safe and healthy neighborhoods update. I wanted to give a couple of updates uh, in our ongoing efforts to uh, take meaningful action steps, working with members of the community, uh, you know, uh, colleges and the university and others uh, to uh, uh, make positive. Uh, uh, changes in some of our neighborhoods that are that are under stress, and uh, I wanted to say a couple things on rental uh, property registration. Uh, we've had a uh, voluntary effort that was part of a letter uh, uh, mass mailing, as well as an online uh, registration effort that has resulted with well over a thousand properties being having information provided on their uh, status. And that's very helpful uh, in our ongoing efforts to have good information about uh, all of the properties in town. Um, we have had a uh, concerted effort on our inspection services and health and fire inspection teams, uh, really on a complaint-driven process. Um, you know, at any given time, particularly in recent weeks, uh, there's 40 or more uh, complaints that are being acted upon, and I think we are beginning, uh, I know we are, uh, with the resources, with your support and town meeting support that have been put in place, uh, becoming more responsive and timely responsive, whether it's from the building department, uh, health, uh, health or fire, on, on responding to those 
uh, complaints that come in that are code and code related and otherwise. Uh, one such proactive effort, and I brought some extra copies of the of a uh, of the handout uh, from our health department. Um, a brochure was created and, and leafleted in uh, houses and rental units, particularly those closest to the university campus, looking at uh, uh, you know responsibilities uh, about uh, renting, um, um, what to look for as tenants uh, uh, for basic safety needs. Uh, uh, some additional uh, feedback about uh, good neighbor uh, practices, uh, rules and regulations and best practices on uh, accumulation of trash and cleanup, uh, and some updated education efforts on uh, the amount of furniture in particular that's stored outside. And um, we've had, based on feedback from uh, residents, uh, as well as our own feedback from staff out being in the neighborhoods all the time that we've had a decrease in the amount of uh, exterior mattresses and furniture and overflowing trash kind of complaints in some of these neighborhoods. That's not to say that there is no problem. That's to say that there's some progress uh, that is being made and there's a concerted ongoing effort uh, that's underway. Uh, um, whether it's complaint driven or just prevention in the first place through education and then a, a more timely follow up by primarily uh, uh, the health department or sanitarian uh, when complaints do and those, those uh, issues are being uh, dealt with faster. Um, so I'm pleased about that. Uh, next I want to let you know that uh, you know there's a real action agenda here it's rental registration, some of the code enforcement issues, uh, there's bylaws of various types uh, under various stages of development. Um, I am intending to uh, work with the chair and, and uh, bring forward ideally at your next select board meeting, regular meeting on October 15th, uh, a summary of of uh, a detailed action agenda over the next several months uh, that would culminate in, in a number of uh, uh, action proposals at the Springtown meeting. Um, and I want to um, outline both uh, uh, substance and process in much more detail at your October 15th meeting. Thank you. So this is something that uh, town manager and I have talked about. It, there's a bunch of stuff going on internally uh, in relation to this issue, but the community doesn't know about it yet. And the community is frustrated with these issues, understandably. I mean, it's frustrating to all of us to, to, uh, to see some of the, the problems that are ongoing. Um, so to, to find a way to comprehensively present this so that the community knows that this is being worked on in all of these different ways, I think will be very helpful to folks. Um, and that's why we've tried to uh, prioritize these safe and healthy neighborhoods reports in general, try and make them more detailed, but it, we really need kind of a broader and more detailed overview at our next meeting, so that was more than we could do at this meeting. But just so you know, that's coming up. Also, uh, just related to that, on October the 9th, I think it is, if that's the Tuesday, I'm going to be speaking at Amherst Club about the town's safe and healthy neighborhoods uh, issues also. So this is this is really about letting folks know just how many resources, just how much time, how much staff, how much creativity is being directed at uh, this problem solving both in the short term and in the long term. So look <coughs> forward to that on the 15th. Questions or comments? Ms. Stein. I'm just, um, I think it was Alyssa that asked for this police report. Um, was it you? I'm agreeing. That's part of my campus and community coalition stuff. Okay, this one. Yep. I'm, I'm depressed by the statistics because I know how hard people have been working and I know how much has been going on behind the scenes and it just seems like it gets worse and worse. 
we'll get to that in a little while for l with liaison reports. But uh, but yes, thank you okay. for mentioning. Sorry, that. I just thought Quite that right. was supposed to be part of this, Miss Brewer. So you're going to bring this part. It wasn't clear if this should be part of the safe and healthy neighborhood discussion or if it will be uh, more right, part of the, the packet. It was not clear. Coalition. Yeah, no, it goes with the it goes with the university uh, letter and the sign and the um, collegian article. We're all pieces for my campus and community coalition. Right. And then my other comment is in regards to the safe and safe and healthy neighborhood um, report, and it doesn't really fit in with the plan as you're outlining it. But something that I think we should have clarified for us because it's come up now with um, both a neighborhood and a property owner who's talked about hiring private security, and I think just as a board and as a community, we need to understand what the limitations are sure. of those like. What does that even mean? I mean, so they come and knock on my door. So what? What do I care? Um, is it in my lease? Is it you know? What are their? What's their role? In case that continues to be, <coughs> I know it happened a couple of years ago. It's happening now, and hopefully it'll never be needed again. But just to clarify where that fits, that would be good. Okay. <coughs> All right. Uh, next uh, in your packet is a an update of the. Uh, parking system uh, issues where we are uh, addressing one by one uh, in the rollout of our new parking uh, parking machines in the downtown. And this is a, uh, a status report really as of Friday. And I just wanted to highlight a couple of them. Um, um, there's some new software item B being loaded that will improve the speed of processing of a transaction because sometimes in the what seems like an interminable amount of time which really isn't but it's a matter of seconds but it's uh, it not infrequently is causing a customer to attempt to figure out if it's registered or trying to reverse an entry and that creates additional complications so this uh, 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 next uh, uh, update on the software we sh should make that issue much better uh, there's some lighting issues in the lots and in town hall um, uh, the power connectivity issue has been uh, finished and uh, the light fixtures are, are being scheduled for installation uh, you will notice when the town hall is paved that the lighting back there will be much better for example which has been a concern concern for some time. We're also working with the uh, parking machine manufacturer on an appropriate light fixture for the machines themselves because we've had complaints about visibility of the screen uh, in the evening hours. Um, that's proceeding. Um, item E, uh, blue P lot signs, so that's the international parking symbol, it's just greater uh, identification of where our public parking spaces are, in fact, for uh, uh, those who aren't sure. And that's part of a downtown wayfinding and sign project, but it's been broken up into phases. Uh, there's been a staff group meeting uh, that also included a representative from the Business Improvement District, and they've come up with uh, some signage and banners for this uh, phase one of this effort. Um, Those are those are the those are the uh, uh, the big ones. So you also included a uh, a draft of uh, informational signage. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. On the back side is a uh, we're looking for feedback. This is not the sign that has been ordered, but this is a template for feedback, and it's one of the. Uh, uh, one of the issues is um, uh, legibility or having the instructions right at eye level uh, so that when you're doing your transaction into the machine, uh, we've looked at other communities as well, and it's not uncommon for the kind of step-by-step -step, you know, procedure to be posted on a sign near the machine in addition to the on-screen display. So this is a... Uh, this is a, uh, a template that we're working on and any and all feedback to myself, uh, Mr. Pooler, would be great. Thank you. 
Ms. Brewer. I was just going to mention that um, get, there are obviously all these little things to be worked out. But on the plus side, when I called on, my, on, the, on September 11th and said, you know, it says there's all free parking and the lot across from the library. And they said, yes, we know, we're working on that. And you know, like I got right through to a person. I didn't identify myself. And uh, it was, I was just a random caller. And they were quite helpful over the phone, like, don't worry about it. You know, if you're going to be there longer than three hours, then yes, a parking enforcement person might come by. But they had the whole thing worked out in terms of response rather than, well, I don't know. <laughs> so right. we're doing a good job responding to problems as well. So that I thought that was yeah. a good test of it. As I like it. Right. Other questions or comments? Um, I would just note that um, the it's getting darker earlier <laughs> so yeah. quickly so yeah. the lighting if that if that yep. can be prioritized yep. um, that that's been people's biggest complaint I think the complaints kind of go away in the summertime because it stays light it's not a problem um, but it will it, it's going to be so dark so if it's possible to kind of yep. get a rush on that I think that would be very helpful okay, okay. Okay, next, uh, quick <coughs> excuse me. updates on a couple of studies that are underway. First, our housing uh, uh, study. Um, we are using uh, funds uh, to create a housing production plan, and the town has engaged uh, Karen Sonnenberg. Uh, she's a housing and planning consultant uh, from the eastern part of the state. Uh, she's done these types of plans for uh, 35 other communities in Massachusetts, including fairly recently Northampton's housing plan, very well regarded uh, in the field. Uh, the basic timeline of things is uh, um, she is scheduled to be completing her housing needs assessment, and you heard an example of that earlier in comment period about uh, uh, some uh, needs uh, in one one category of housing. Um, so there's a whole data gathering phase going on with town staff, housing and sheltering committee, uh, UMass, uh, and others uh, on data gathering. Um, um, there will also be an evaluation of the town zoning bylaw and how it helps uh, either create challenges or identify strategies that help in the production of affordable housing. Uh, we expect, uh, in terms of the public process here, uh, on October 24th, there'll be a second meeting between the consultant and the Housing and Sheltering Committee. And that'll be a review of the consultant's draft needs assessment. Um, there'll also be a public forum uh, with the Housing and Sheltering, uh, sheltering Committee, the consultant, and the planning board uh, to hear from residents. And it's really looking at the draft, uh, or the, the um, uh, draft of the draft. <laughs> uh, and then December 1st is the expectation that a draft housing production plan will be submitted. Uh, there'll be another public forum in mid-December uh, with the goal of having the plan finalized by uh, New Year's Day. So that's the housing uh, study. So that there, she's involved full, full bore on this and uh, there's a detailed timeline now to get, get us to the finish line, which is when the hard part starts. Now that we have an orga a more organized plan identifying specific uh, tangible uh, ways we can fulfill the needs that have been uh, identified. Thank you. Questions or comments? Ms. Brewer. Since this was the other thing Alyssa um, <coughs> got into associated with this particular project, I just want to state that I had no idea that the town manager was going to do an update, which is wonderful, um, at this particular meeting. It worked out really well. But the reason I was got involved in this to begin with is because I'm the liaison to the Housing and Sheltering Committee, they had asked back when the RFP was originally sent out for the whole thing, back in July, they sent out this, e this memo that never quite got to the select board and there was all this confusion and yada, 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 and we weren't meeting as often, et cetera. So finally, by the time it was going to make it into our packet, of course, times had changed. 
And so then I went to a couple more of their meetings and I said, look, I've got to write a cover to this because this is going to, it's changed a little bit and it lays out very specifically, you know, these three things will happen, but actually those things have changed a little. So I wrote one and guess what? More had changed. <laughs> so Nate fixed it all up for me. I had written at the bottom, all mistakes are Alyssa Brewer's, not Nate Malloy's. <laughs> and instead he just went ahead and fixed it all. So, um, that's what you have in front of you that they've written September 21 at the top of that John has just gone over. And he makes it sound so straightforward, but when you consider all the different pieces that people were confused about and that people were confused about at these various meetings, this tries to help address what some of those things are. And, um, but I think that your overview was terrific. But that's just what that was about, was trying to explain where they had been, where they were headed, and where they are now. And I thought that was very helpful, so thank you. <coughs> Other questions or comments? Okay, next. Okay, next, uh, transportation uh, task force study. We had a committee that met several times uh, in the late winter and uh, uh, through the month of June, uh, an RFP had gone out to engage a consultant to assist the committee uh, develop a town-wide uh, transportation plan in keeping with the principles of the town's master plan. Uh, there was only one bid received, uh, and the members of the task force felt uh, pretty strongly uh, that um, there should be another <laughs> attempt to solicit uh, 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 potential interested firms um, that is the next step on this. That RFP is going back out. Uh, we'll see if we can uh, engage uh, more firms on this. Uh, so they haven't met since the end of June. There is a consensus at that meeting back in June that uh, there's no way we're going to finish this project by the end of calendar 13. Uh, they want to extend their their. Uh, term and I'm very open to that to kind of see this see this through okay questions or comments so uh, refresh our memories this is the same or different than whatever uh, the university was going to do for us mm -hmm. as part of the gateway settlement or uh, whatever. it's it's similar but different I mean UMass has their own transportation plan uh, so that information and data is assisting the town effort doing something town-wide. So the university was going to do something for us or do something for them that they were going to give to us or something that is a transportation study for the town or for that general area, or the neighborhoods around the university? Yes. And do we have that or not yet? Uh, we do. We do? Yeah. And is that a public document? It must be a public uh, document. It, it is a public document. I'm not sure if it's posted, though. No. I, I think it would be fascinating. Sure. And I would like to see that. Yeah. Okay, good. Okay. Other questions or comments about transportation studies? All right. Okay. Uh, sorry. Um, upcoming. Recent and upcoming, thank you. Uh, I want you all to thank AMPS. That I'm trying to catch your attention at <laughs> five of nine. Uh, AMPS is uh, Amherst Neighborhood Tree Stewards. And I had the pleasure this past Saturday, the 22nd, of joining <laughs> uh, a group of neighbors on Woodside Avenue. Uh, Maria Heim and her husband helped organize this with Alan Snow and uh, uh, Hope Crolius and others from the Public Shade Tree Committee. Um, and this is our first real live group of neighborhood tree stewards. So there were. Uh, Woodside Avenue is a beautiful street, but there's some big trees uh, along that roadway that are old or dead or dying. Uh, and uh, there was a need identified. Working with uh, Alan Snow, our tree warden, uh, uh, identified locations and species for tree replacement. Uh, and Saturday morning was a combination uh, community gathering, uh, tree planting demo, best practices, and then the, the team of neighbors with, with Alan and the Shade Tree Committee uh, folks spent the re rest of the morning uh, planting 10 trees up and down Woodside Avenue. And uh, it 
that's a uh, great example of what we hope to see a lot more of over the next three years when we uh, plant upwards of 2,000 uh, uh, public shade trees in Amherst. And uh, I just wanted to do a shout out on that for all the, all the people who were involved to make that happen. It really was a wonderful, uh, wonderful morning to see that, that happening. Um, uh, also, um, uh, equally as exciting uh, to some, uh, letters will be going out in the next day or two to all of our licensed taxi companies in Amherst. Uh, the draft regulations are ready, and as I indicated at our last meeting, there'll be a process where the, those draft regulations are sent out to the taxi companies. We'll be getting those to you electronically, and we'll post them on the town website. Uh, there are a couple of meetings with taxi uh, company owners. Uh, they'll be invited uh, to those meetings. They're happening, um, I believe, in the third week of October. We'll get the specific dates in the letter uh, to meet with town uh, staff, get some feedback on the draft regulations, as a, and you'll see the draft regs, and we'll talk about them. Um, at your next meeting on the 15th as well, and then we're hoping that we're in a position to have you be able to take a position on those and enact uh, some updated regulations as early as your November 5th meeting for application for the renewals that go into effect January 1. Great. So Questions or comments about the taxi reg process? All right. And uh, I'll stop there. Any other questions or comments for Mr. Musanti about anything? All right, then member reports. First member report is BCG update. BCG had its first meeting of the FY14 budget calendar planning process. Um, and the summary points are in your packet. Um, there are three. The first one uh, it just summarizes the year-end budget information that we already had a presentation on from uh, Mr. Pooler and Ms. Aldrich at the end of August, I believe it was. Um, and the third one <coughs> is about upcoming meeting dates. So those are kind of easy and obvious. Um, the one that I wanted us to just pay some attention to is number two, and that was about the... Um, uh, $585,000 in additional state aid above what was budgeted. This was part <coughs> of, this is something we had lobbied um, state government for. This was that $65 million if the, if the governor and the legislature were really quite confident of having that money uh, ahead of time to please add it to our bottom line of unrestricted general government aid as opposed to making a one-time appropriation in the fall, which was what happened last year. Uh, they didn't make the decision to do that until, of course, at the at the end of our budget process. So, uh, so that was not incorporated into any of our plans. So we have a balanced budget without that money. Um, the recommendations from the town schools and libraries last spring, because this is all for this year's money, uh, FY13's money, was that if we were to come up with revenue in excess of what town schools and libraries had budgeted for, that that money would be put into reserves uh, and consistent with the select board's budget policy guidelines to the town manager last year. We said we wanted a balanced budget that didn't use reserves and that uh, didn't have additional spending. If we had additional revenue, we wanted that to either go into reserves, capital, or OPEB. Um, so the select board has had these conversations multiple times, and we haven't had any personnel changes, uh, unlike some of the other boards and committees, uh, in the meantime. So what BCG is looking for is feedback from each of the boards and committees about the recommendation from uh, Mr. Musanti and from Mr. Pooler that that $585,000 be the initial deposit in our uh, created but unfunded OPEB account and that this would happen at fall town meeting. In the future, perhaps as soon as spring town meeting, we'll have a recommendation for how we might be funding that going forward uh, that would be essentially a line item in the in the budget part of the warrant um, 
in the same section as where we do our assessments to the Hampshire County Retirement Board, uh, things like that, that would be some kind of OPEB uh, deposit. We're currently undergoing a new actuarial evaluation of our OPEB status, so uh, so that will that will change what whatever that giant number is of liability that we owe. Um, but this is the recommendation: is that that money, uh, consistent with what the policy has been to not spend any additional revenue that came in to put it in reserves to actually make that a specific kind of reserves, which is to say OPEB, um, and uh, and to consider that for, for fall town meeting. That is the recommendation. Am I missing anything critical here? Mr. Musanti, am I missing anything about the recommendation? Uh, no. So that's the, that's the, to put out there for us to think about. So questions or comments, Ms. Brewer? So as your other BCG rep who had to both come late and leave early, my favorite kind of meeting, um, associated with that, I gave my usual, yeah, I don't really feel a terrible need to put the money in OPEB speech, which I know all the reasons for and against. Um, but what I was and what I'm not clear now on is the timing. I'm assuming that we're going to be going forward with a town meeting article and it would just be nice for BCG to help coordinate to, to help serve as a point of reference for the fact that every board's going to have that discussion before they get to town meeting obviously but we would be taking a position on a town meeting article so I'm just a little confused about what the feedback mechanism is right now are we just waiting and having a discussion associated with a town meeting article for the fall about that specific amount of money and we're assuming all those and it's not really that BCG has to do something else right now other than have given everyone the alert that that's what's going to happen right and it's sort of a check-in with all of the home boards and committees as I said there's been a lot of personnel change on school committee and library trustees the same group that agreed to you know, we wouldn't spend it, we would put it in reserves, we wouldn't make a recommendation to town meeting to, to fund new spending. Um, th those folks haven't checked in on that. So it's, it's a bigger question for them okay. than it is for us, unless we've had some sort of dramatic, you know, change of heart that like suddenly we wanna, you know, build a half million dollar something. Um, so, but, but really any kind of feedback about it because the recommendation will ultimately go forward based on feedback either as putting the money directly into um, free cash or stabilization or to put it into OPEB. So if right. all the boards and committees say, eh, OPEB, I don't think so, then it would just be a reserves appropriation. Ms. Brewer. I, I guess I just wanted to, to, follow, to follow on that then, that I would hope that they all remember to share as we heard and I had not fully processed before this particular meeting, which was that if we put the money in there, although we can't just treat it like other reserves, we can use it for current health care costs. And I think that is a, that to me is a huge piece of the discussion as well. So even if we were to decide that no, we're not going to have a regular schedule of doing this, which would be against what the Finance Committee, I'm sure, will recommend to us. But if even if we were to decide that, it's not like the money's just stuck sitting there waiting for some day to be spent. There are ways that we are perfectly authorized to spend it now on current retiree health care costs, as I understand it. Yeah, Mr. Pooler uh, went through that a little bit to the benefit of the budget coordinating group because there are the current pay-as-you-go related retiree health and other benefit costs, and then there's the unfunded future cost liability of those that we're trying to um, develop a funding plan so that it doesn't consume a greater and greater share of the uh, operating budget so over a long period of time, like 40 years. Right, and so I appreciated that it's not as yeah. inflexible as it might at right. first appear. Right. It's, so, Ms. Brewer and others have have expressed the idea. You know, what if the landscape changes entirely as far as how OPEB, how uh, not how OPEB, how this um, liability is considered, and how uh, what approach one takes to retired uh, healthcare retirees' healthcare benefits? Um, the the bottom line is any money uh, 
appropriated to this trust fund can be used for retiree health benefits. It's not like it's sitting in some it's sitting there until you get up to your magic valuation number or whatever. It can always be used for that. So, so you know, you have some kind of sea change in in sense of whatever, and that just means you could be taking the money. That it, it serves very much like our healthcare trust fund. Um, you could be using the money from there in future budgets if if that was necessary. Ms. Stein. Well, the point that I was going to make is I've heard people say, well, we have a million dollars extra. We ought to spend it for this or that. And what I think it's really important is that people realize we have these liabilities that we have to deal with sooner or later, and it's just going to eat up more of our budget later so that any dents we could make would help. Thank you. Any other thoughts or feedback? And uh, just so you know, we will have another meeting before BCG's next meeting. BCG's next meeting is the 18th, so we're meeting on the 15th, um, which is after our October 11th meeting where we get the uh, budget projections from Mr. Pooler and Mr. Musanti. So that will all give us kind of a greater context for any additional feedback we might want to give. So I think we're kind of where we are at this point, unless people want to mention other things. But I will bring this up again at the 15th so that we have that uh, information from the October 11th meeting. Okay. Liaison and representative reports. Anyone? Ms. Drayton. I have, I have a couple. Um, first of all, I want to report on the um, Recycling and Refuse Management Committee's summit meeting. Um, rather, um, I think an unusual um, uh, organization of it. Uh, they had, um, uh, we invited Jim Pastrang to come and uh, moderate um, so that in the time that they, in the, in the course of the evening, um, they were able to, the, the RRMC was able to identify the needs and, and, and establish goals for zero waste, um, for, for Amherst becoming a zero waste town. Um, there'll be a, a, a report Susan is putting together, sort of collecting all of that stuff, and, and so I'll be bringing that forward as soon as it's ready. Um, it may even be presented at town meeting in some form, right, Susan? Any event. Um, I also uh, sat in with the uh, town meeting coordinating committee, and um, a number of things I'd like to report from there. First of all, um, a little demonstration. Um, in the town room, there is a, a prototype of uh, the new sound system. You've heard me mention this a couple of times before. Uh, so these microphones live in the closet over here. They, they're in chargers. You just pop it out, you turn it on, so you get the green light, and then you just use it uh, for your meeting. Um, unfortunately, as as uh, Ms. Stein has just demonstrated, <laughs> the modulation is entirely in how you use the mic and not uh, in the system. So uh, that'll be helpful, but still um, know how to use those. Um, they spoke briefly about our um, suggestions for town meeting and um, are, are seriously considering a consent calendar. That, that seemed to be the, one of the ideas that really got some traction with them. Um, they spoke about their, their budget, their need for a budget. Um, they spent quite a bit of time on discussing um, the need for funding uh, dependent care for, um, for town meeting. Um, it's never been a part of their budget um, since 2004 when town meeting um, put in some money for one year. So that's an ongoing discussion. And, um, just um, they identified um, not only need for child care, but possibly for um, elder care, dependent care. So, also, um, they're starting a new initiative. Um, um, they're organizing uh, or planning to organize a number of environmental forums. There's a number of issues which they've identified as being um, important to deal with. Um, they want to invite uh, folks like uh, Mr. McKibbins to come in and speak to us, the citizens, about um, global warming and environmental issues. Um, they they want to get involved with uh, uh, recycling, uh, a number of things. So that's a development that, that um, I'm curious to see how that, that um, moves along. Uh, last, um, a uh, very brief conversation about minutes, about meetings committees getting their minutes onto the web. 
there is a process um, which um, um, we're double checking to make sure it's still in place. About a year and a half ago, we got a memo that described a process where the chairs would get a, a password. They could get on the town website and just enter their minutes or, or assign somebody uh, the task of using that password and entering their minutes. So that's something that I'm hoping to make an announcement here to chairs. Um, well, in a little while, uh, uh, Mr. Kunis has to get back to me on whether or not those, those uh, directions are still good. But that, pro that mechanism is in place in some form, and we'll just have to get it out there. Thank you. Questions or comments from Mr. Hayden? Very good. Ms. Brewer, and then Ms. Stein. Um, actually, two things on TMCC. One is that would be great if it turns out that it's the same or it's different or whatever with, with Mr. Bakunas and the uh, chairs signing in. But I mean, we've had chairs change since then. We've had committee members change. We've had committees who clearly have lost that memo, um, <laughs> speaking of some I can think of. So um, it would be good to resend that information out to remind people of that expectation that people would like to see have happen. The other thing is I'm, I've, I liked the way you phrased the uh, environmental forums comment, TMCC. I really don't have any idea what this has to do with TMCC's work, frankly, and I don't, I'm a little uncomfortable with that, but the TMCC is a body of town meeting, and so I guess it's up to town meeting to give feedback to TMCC about that, but I'm not clear on beyond the fact that obviously these are all things we're all interested in, um, why it's the role of TMCC to have forums like that. But yeah, okay. I unfortunately couldn't stay for that, the, the rest of that discussion around that. At, uh, so I'll, I'll let you know. Perfect. All right, Ms. Stein. Okay, for my raise, Certainly. I just have two. Um, one is the personnel board meeting that I attended along with Mr. Musanti. Um, Deb Rabway was introduced. Um, she noted or it was noted that Leslie Salisbury <laughs> would be a professional assistant to, to um, human resources, um, and also noted that Nate Malloy got a well-deserved promotion to, senior, to a senior planner position, which is going to be called a community planner. Um, Sharon Sherry uh, presented a potential reorganization of the library staff with a goal of increasing efficiency of the staff and parity, and the personnel board will consider that at a future date. The Ag Commission had their first meeting with a quorum uh, for uh, their first in a while um, because of the quorum issues, and the first question they asked me was, had I heard anything from the Attorney General? <laughs> so I could at least report that they are now working on this issue of how quorum should be determined in committees of small communities. Um, they are interested in growing food in Amherst and selling local food in Amherst. Um, some of the issues that were touched on were the community gardens, which are somewhat um, not in as good shape as they should be, and they were thinking that we really need a committee to work on this. Um, they also are interested in getting tunnels um, near the edge, maybe, of farms on farming that's happening on conservation land and permaculture. These are all different ways of growing food as well as far traditional farms. They talked about the summer market um, and the winter market will be on again this, this year. Uh, it'll uh, start two weeks after the summer market ends. And they noted that Greenfield had gotten a big grant for storage of and selling of local um, products over the whole year, so like a big freezer and that sort of thing. So that they wondered if they would be able to maybe with area farms be able to come up with that sort of funding too. So that's my report. Thank you. Any questions or comments from Ms. Stein? Thank you. Other liaison representative reports? I'll Ms. Brewer. jump in. Um, CDBG Advisory Committee. So I'd sent you all an email today that just happened to, to, to alerting the CDBG Advisory Committee. I just forwarded you 
that email that Nate had sent to them saying, hey, all the proposals are in. It's, he's already got it up online. Um, the links weren't working earlier today, but they should be now. So if you want to see what those are, obviously it's for way more money than we have, but that's the way it always is, and they get to make hard decisions. Their hearing is on Thursday evening at 6.30 at the Bain Center. So that is coming right up. And we already talked about the reallocation issues, so there's that. Um, I have nothing to report on LSSC Commission Disability Access Advisory Committee, although I haven't been going. One of the things that they are pursuing that I'm aware of that's very interesting to them is the um, coordination between the town and the schools on the ADA transition plan. The ADA and transition plan is something that has to get funded every so often. It's a big deal kind of plan. Um, it hasn't been worked on for a couple of years on the town side. It's been unclear as to the coordination on the school side, both with the elementary and the region, and who's responsible for the playgrounds, and how does it all fit together. And we've got a lot of new players between the facility. Our facilities person is still you know, newer associated with these plans, and then the people at the schools that are responsible for transition plans have also changed. So they're very excited to get another look at how all that's going to work with our new um, human resources director as well so they're pretty pumped about that all coming together and knowing who to talk to when they have concerns about a particular aspect of the transition plan because who's responsible for what BCG we already talked about regional school district planning committee and planning board just keeps uh, jumping right along we have meetings uh, it seems like every week but um, between the subcommittees and the others because we have a really tight time frame we've got one grant that we're in for, we've got another grant that we're about to apply for in hopes of just making these things work. You saw at the bottom of the BCG and also another piece in your packet about a four towns meeting associated with regionalization issues. Not to be confused with the usual four towns meetings, but um, quite cleverly was realized that this is something that needs to be talked about by all the different bodies of all the different towns so that everybody's on board and understanding what's happening with it in addition to the big press release pushes that will come on later on in the process. So that's something to look forward to. I hope that many of you can be there. And then for Housing and Sheltering Committee, the, I believe I've already done that too. So, oh yes, except for the fact that one of the things they're excited about is that um, between having Denise LaDuke from Amherst Housing Authority on that committee as a member of the committee and their own interests, they were able to come up with a tour that we're going to take tomorrow associated with various affordable housing projects in town, both existing and um, you know, recent and ongoing. And just to give people a sense of, you know, like for example, I did not know that Clark House actually has an affordability expiration coming up at some point. You know, we always think of Rolling Green in the near future, but there's others out there too. And so we obviously aren't gonna be going around and like peeking everybody's windows, but we'll at least get a sense of how things are laid out and what types of things we have around town because not everybody in town knows where all those things are. So we're getting a lot more coordination on that side. So exciting stuff. Thank you. Questions or comments from Ms. Brewer? How soon is Clark House expiring? That's not necessarily. Now I scared you, didn't I? It's yes, actually not until 2020. So see, you got plenty of time. Another year before <laughs> yeah. it really shake. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Exactly. But to actually see it, you know, written down, it's like kind of nice. Amazing, though. Other questions or comments from Ms. Brewer? Other liaison reports. Okay, um, I will mention then Campus and Community Coalition. So in your packets, I gave you several documents and uh, I'll kind of talk about them in general and then specifically. Um, so we had a meeting last week and this was the first one since the new semester started. One of the things that we did was kind of share feedback on how things are going so far. And as you can see from the police statistics and as you've read in the newspaper, it's been a tough beginning of the semester. It absolutely has. Um, it was a tough meeting uh, because it is very frustrating for us all to be working very hard on this in very many ways and to have numbers that are going up. So the numbers, and this is in your packet document, is talking about police response calls, uh, arrests and summonses in the first three weekends of the year. Um, and, uh, and it raises a lot of questions. Um, among them, how do you measure the success of what we're doing? And unfortunately, 
you know, what we have here is a three-dimensional problem. And so the numbers themselves aren't going to tell you something. Um, so, for example, I was, I was saying to uh, Captain Pronovost, who presented the numbers, I said, you know, what, what kinds of tools, what else do you need? What, what would um, help the situation that you see on the ground? He says, well, you know, more cops would be one thing. Um, so, all right, we've got public safety needs for sure. At the same time, if there were more cops in general, uh, and we were talking specifically about a particular disturbance at Meadow Street, uh, the townhouse apartments, where there was uh, a really huge disturbance and there was like one arrest from that. I said, you know, what's going on on the ground there? What do you need? Had he, had there been more resources in terms of officers there, we would have had vastly higher number of arrests. Would that mean that was then less successful <laughs> you know so the numbers the numbers are complicated you know so we've got this new nuisance house bylaw well guess what now that we have a nuisance house bylaw we have nu nuisance house violations being issued before we had the nuisance house bylaw we would have had zero nuisance house violations being issued but that's not the same as not having nuisance house problems now we just have a way of of um, marking them and and penalizing for them so, so numbers aren't going to be how we, how we determine the success of this. Obviously, the fact that there is an ongoing need for these responses, um, that is very frustrating. And I, I think we also have to be realistic in knowing that that part of it isn't going to go away. I mean, you're never going to not have any off-campus parties. I don't think. <laughs> um, <laughs> that, that isn't really the expectation. But, um, but how, how, you, how you measure the success of this is, is a complicated question and one that the, uh, one that the coalition is, is struggling with. Um, one thing that I think is clear to all of us is, you know, you cannot see what isn't there. So you're not seeing all of the stuff that isn't happening because of these efforts. And so uh, all of our information suggests that, that the things that we're doing are very effective. In fact, just at the chancellor's uh, reception on Friday, I was talking with someone from the university who told me that the $300 fines, very, very effective. That is, that is something that has a lot of traction with the students who end up in the dean of students' office. So that's good. You know, so that's one way. Even though they've gotten the fine, um, they, so you could say that that's, that's unfortunate or, or that's a measure of lack of success that they got it. I would think of it more in terms of the fact that they're not going to do it again by and large. When you have a gigantic student body, as the University of Massachusetts does, there are going to be a lot of people who need to learn these lessons the hard way. But the fact is, the repeat offender situation is extremely low. Um, so I, I just want to give a little bit of context for that, uh, none of which changes the fact that it has been a very difficult, especially from a public safety perspective, um, first couple weeks of the semester. Ms. Stein. A um, couple of things. One is that one of the periods, this pe the more recent uh, 2012 data, is one day longer than the other period measured. And the second is it would be really interesting to know how the weather compared, because we know that really gorgeous weather, <sighs> sigh, <laughs> is more of a problem right. um, and brings out large numbers of students wanting to congregate and so on and so forth. Right. Yep. So, so the data, the data tells a certain story. It raises certain questions. It answers mm -hmm. certain other questions. Um, it's all, it's all information and it's all useful. Um, but again, you know, exactly what you do about it is hard to know. Um, so then the other things that, uh, that I gave you are kind of to tell, partially to, to tell more of the story also, I guess, not partially, in very much in to tell the rest not the rest, more of the story. So part of that story is the uh, email from Jean Kim, who's the Vice Chancellor of Student Affairs, that this, we call it essentially like a safe celebrations email. That was something that went out um, the week, uh, I guess it's about two weeks ago now, um, talking to students about 
expectations and consequences and accountability. I just wanted to give you this as an example of the kinds of ways that these messages are being sent by the university. They're being reinforced at every opportunity. Now, the fact that we don't have 100% compliance from the students, come on now, we're not going to have that. But I think it's really important to show how the university and the town are really on the same page with this stuff. The university has been a tremendous partner in this, incredibly responsive to town concerns, and we really are moving forward on this together. Um, another example of that is the poster, the colorful poster that is in your packets. That was something that they did. They had been communicating this message verbally in different ways, but this is the first time they did it as, as a picture, and they're going to be even more uh, kind of explicit with how they get this message out going forward. But this is specifically about students in Southwest. This is a poster that was hung in all the Southwest residence halls. Um, encouraging them to go to and from downtown via Mass Ave instead of going through Fearing Street, Lincoln Ave, uh, through the neighborhoods. And so it's telling students specifically the message about being uh, respectful of your neighbors and better yet, kind of stay away from the neighbors and, and try and keep yourself on the uh, more appropriate pathways. Um, these are the kinds of messages that, uh, that are being sent and, and kids need to be reminded of all the time. We've talked about other ways of doing that. We, uh, I, I think it was two years ago, they tried to incentivize the, a certain route by having the food truck out there and whether or not that was an optimal location is a question, but um, how, to, how to encourage the things we want and discourage the things we don't want are uh, constantly being evaluated and tweaked. So you have that information. Um, and then the other thing that I gave you is an article that was in the Collegian uh, last <laughs> week about the UMass You Make a Difference Day. And um, I think it's really important, and I think it would have been really nice if the coverage of the weekend that included all the information about the Meadow Street disturbance, et cetera, also talked about when you think about student impacts off campus over the weekend, a very significant student impact off campus last weekend was 200 students partnering with the town on different service projects. It's a really great article. Um, one of the projects was a big cleanup effort at Puffer's Pond, uh, and Dave Zomek headed this up, and uh, he, he gives some comments in the article, but uh, he and I have talked about it at greater length. What this means as far as not just making Puffer's Pond uh, cleaner and getting it in better shape right now is all of the staff time and resources that either don't need to be put towards that or weren't going to be, that we simply don't have the, the staff and the, the time and the money to do. So that is a lasting impact on Puffer's Pond and on the community that is, uh, that is really important. And folks need to um, be aware that there is this whole other kind of way that, that students are very quietly having um, having very big impacts, very positive impacts on the community all the time. Um, so there were lots of projects like that. It was about 20 kids, 25 kids at Puffer's Pond, uh, and there were about more than 200 students participating all around. Uh, Mr. Musanti worked with uh, Lisa Queenan and other folks from the university to put together these volunteer opportunities, and, uh, and they're great. And so that was a very organized event. There are things like that going on all the time. Um, we all know about students who volunteer with the town, with different service organizations, who are generally having a big impact on the community all the time. So I just kind of wanted to get that message out there also. Um, one of the students even says in that article, and they're referring specifically to the uh, to the bad thing that happened at Puffer's Pond last spring when, when truly the, the property was incredibly trashed by a, a bunch of students on a beautiful day. Um, the student was saying, you know what, that's not us. You, we should not all be tainted with that. Um, and, uh, and we are a positive force. So I, I thought that was really powerful and I wanted folks to have access to that also. Um, these are ongoing issues, it just in every way. Uh, we've got the neighborhood issues. We've got specific public safety challenges. We've got communication issues with the students. I mean, it, it, it's everything. And, um, and so I want you to know how 
dedicated the coalition is to dealing with all of these issues, how dedicated Mr. Musanti is, and how much resources, staff and time resources, he has put into the coalition work as well as the, uh, the other stuff that's happening just internally within um, Town Hall. And really, again, to say just what incredible partners the university has been in this. This is something I've actually been doing a fair amount of research on lately. And if you think that this is a problem that is common only to Amherst, you're just totally wrong. I mean, this is, this is what happens in college communities. These exact same challenges, often much worse results than what we have. Um, one of the things I was looking at is uh, code of student conduct being enforced off campus, which is something that um, the coalition uh, was able to interact. I really took a lead role in getting the university to change their wording and make that very unambiguous. That seems like a no-brainer. That is not a no-brainer. That is a very complicated thing to do, especially legally, um, and it's a question that many universities and colleges have faced and, and come to, to different uh, decisions on. So the fact that that is happening, the fact that that is a regular part of the conversation with students about the accountability that they will be held to for off-campus behaviors, um, it, it, it's really a sign of how allied the university is with the town and with the community's concerns for addressing these issues. Pause for breath. Ms. Brewer. <laughs> I know it's late and I know we're all tired. Um, one thing, I, two quick things, and I, I so appreciate the women's work you deal with this whole project. I mean, and any, every time I meet anyone, whether it's at the Chancellor's or when I was at um, the thing that uh, Dave Sullivan ran last week, it was always, we deal with Stephanie all the time. She's such a pleasure to work with. I can't believe how hard she works on all these things. And I say, and this is just one of the things she works on. So thank you. And um, associated with that, I think one of the questions that has come up, perhaps in an email at some point or something, was um, th someone was questioning what numbers is it are are there that you want to see in terms of student discipline? And I, I'm sure that you would have shared with them what I assume is our shared opinion, which is something along the lines of. X number of students went through this type of training that we make them go through. X number of students had to do community service because they did something. Last year it was this many, this year it was this many. Three students got thrown out, two students got thrown out. People just want to hear that something happened rather than they took care of it and it went into this black hole. I mean, there doesn't seem to be any question that that would be messing with anyone's students' privacy. It's just that kind of, you know, again, how do you interpret it? But I mean, very basic categories is what I think people are looking for. Not that we're looking to find out that Bobby Joe got in trouble last week. Right, right. So we did have um, questions from a, a journalist at the Collegian, and uh, and I didn't copy you all on my answer. I apologize. Sometimes I forget to do that, and I don't notice whether it came into all of us That's or whether right. it came into me. Um, but uh, yeah, so that is about again the university trying to be responsive to the community because there is this perception that the university is incredibly permissive and that they turn a blind eye to things that happen off campus, and that is simply not the truth. Um, but my telling you that isn't enough. <laughs> they need to find ways to be demonstrating to the community what is happening on their side. And they are, of course, very concerned, as, as you alluded to, the privacy rights, the uh, federal privacy rights of the students. But um, but we've made very clear that nobody is looking for, as you said, you know, Joe Schmo, what happened to him for X incident? It's about what does the discipline process look like? What do the outcomes look like? What do the numbers look like? Um, what kinds of uh, kind of interventions and educational efforts are there? What kinds of numbers are there for suspensions and expulsions and other types of measures? Um, I think that people see something bad happen and they say, oh, you know, the kid should be expelled. Well, guess what? The university really is not in the business of expelling students. This is all about trying to, you know, put them on the right path to being, um, to being good, uh, good citizens, good functioning members of society. And, uh, you know, your, your first, your first uh, line of defense isn't to cut them free and say, oh, you screwed up, you're done. It's to say, okay, you know, let's think about what you did. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about the impacts and and have a uh, a, a punishment that is appropriate to the violation. 
and they are. And so some of those violations require extremely <coughs> serious punishments. And so we're going to be getting the numbers on those. So they are looking for a way to give us that information in sort of an aggregate that is meaningful to us, that is kind of demonstrating the kinds of things we're looking for. But also kind of internally, they've got their own logistical problems of, you know, they need to separate you know, uh, a, a kid who got disciplined for having a candle in the dorm, th which is a serious right. offense in the dorms, with the numbers they give us. Right. Uh, you know, so that the the the, right. the candle in the dorm thing that's not relevant to we're talking about um, what off campus responses look like, responses right. to off-campus issues. So th they've really never broken things out in those ways. So, so they're working with their own information and trying to figure out how to give it to us in a meaningful way. But uh, that, that will be forthcoming, and I think pretty soon, actually. That's terrific. And the other comment I just had is I don't even know if this is a fact. So if they could clarify if this is a fact, and if so, what the context behind it was, which is, if alcohol is not allowed in residence halls for tw age 21 students, if that is true, that they are not, that no matter how old the kids are, they aren't allowed to drink on campus. No, I think I think that it is allowed in the residence okay. halls if you're 21. That, we, that would be nice I'm to not clarify. Sure that, that would be I nice to clarify because it does vary between colleges and the university. Mm -hmm. And if that is true, I think that that takes away the people who complain who say, well, they push everything off campus. Because if they are allowed, quote, to responsibly drink in their own room because they're age 21, then no, they're not. The, the whole problem is not off campus. But there is only one alcohol outlet, I believe, on campus at this point. But in terms of their the residence halls, I think it would just be good to get that clarified. OK, I'll get that information for you. Forget I responded to it in any way, just in case I'm completely wrong. <laughs> <laughs> rewind, yeah, I, rewind. I don't um, know. I'll, I'll find out. Other questions or comments? All right, Mr. Wald, your final chance to <laughs> take it or pass. <laughs> Mr. Rooney, I think covered everything. So. Oh, right. Thank you. All right. Um, open meeting law update. So, as you might have guessed, when you got this in the packet and you thought, "Huh, what are we supposed to do with that?" Um, <laughs> it was you were supposed to get this, mm -hmm. and it says request for comments on collective bargaining FAQ, which is referenced at the top of this page. And once again, magically, um, the Division of Open Government has requested comments. And as I wrote in the email today, if a tree falls in the forest, because if you send out a request for comments and you don't send it to anyone, then you don't get any <laughs> responses. Um, I looked at you know a specific set of minutes that said two municipal officials had responded to a particular request for comments. However. A bunch of the, the Mass Publishers Association had responded, legal organizations had responded, because they all knew about it. Well, we didn't even know they'd requested comments. So, um, yeah, so luckily, our representative, who, um, who our town manager knows as a fellow town manager, um, at the Division of Open Government, the Open Meeting Law Advisory Committee, the MMA seat at the table, um, has been working with them on this and really trying to get them to come up to speed on this. And so although MMA is trying to do better at getting information out, um, we've been told that before too. And I also, if you saw in the email, pointed out that I don't even read the Beacon. Piece of paper, old news. I mean, that is just out of date by the time I get it as far as I'm concerned. Although I do have to remember that there are those communities throughout Massachusetts that don't even have dial-up really access, and so maybe they do need a thing like the paper beacon. But the idea that I would look to that, and also the timing is impossible because that only comes out once a month, and these requests for comments are usually six weeks or less. less. So hopefully they'll get there. They're taking little baby steps. They're having trouble with it, but we definitely have the ear of our seat at the table in terms of trying to get them uh, real help on this. Now as to this actual request for comments on collective bargaining agreement FAQ, I guess y'all can look at it and see if we want to talk about it, but I don't know if that it's highest on my list of anything to worry about, but it's just good to know it's out there because it's been kind of nice that they're trying to do all these FAQs even though they're not getting a lot of input on how to do them. Thank you. Questions or comments from Ms. Brewer? All right, chair's report. I think I covered everything I could possibly say in the earlier parts of the meeting. A um, couple of untimed items still to do. Let's take care of those. And I have a question. Yes. Before I make motion, 
Um, there was no motion going with this sugar loaf. Um, I don't know if this was supposed to be in my packet or if this is the original. I think it's an FYI. Is that what it is? It looked like John's signature. Oh. Was there a request for this? I was thinking maybe it was an FYI, just like I, when we I hear about know. Kendrick but Park otherwise being I'm reserved. Ready to it's like, oh, that's nice to know. Okay. Yeah, those aren't, we don't do those, so no. I think that okay. it's either a mistake or an FYI. Okay, so it's an <laughs> FYI. Fine, I just wanted to be just sure. Random FYI. <laughs> okay, thank you. Just in I just, case you thought they were I wish more. somebody would put an, FYI. <laughs> yeah, I wish they would write that at the top, random <laughs> FYI. That would be good. All right, um, the public shade tree um, motion. I move to accept the t uh, charge for the public shade tree committee as a standalone seven member committee as presented. And the charge that you have, I might say, um, benefited greatly from Deborah Roussel's revision from the original charge that we got. And now it has been corrected to reflect the, the membership that the public shade tree committee wanted. So I so moved. Yeah. Second. Uh, further discussion. So we had had a discussion about this a while ago. We agreed to the charge in principle, and then and we said, oh, it doesn't need to come back to us. You know, the formatting and the words, we can just take care of that. But that's yeah. actually fairly ambiguous, and it turned out that it still had some issues. So we decided to just make it nice and formal and bring it back. So that's what we're doing. Yep. Further discussion. All in favor, say aye. 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 That's unanimous. Right. I'm going to go to the special licenses. I don't think we've had. Um, I move to approve a special wine and malt license without the S for Amherst Brewing Company to hold an Oktoberfest on approximately 50 by 75 foot area of the parking lot contiguous to the patio of Amherst Brewing Company on Saturday, October 20th, 2012, from 12 p.m. noon to 5 p.m., John P. Corpita, owner, manager. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Appointments. I move to appoint Michael Hutton Woodland of Amherst to the Public Shade Tree Committee with a term to expire June 30th, 2015. <coughs> Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 And then we have the minutes. And I be I have some suggestions, but they are trivial, and so I'd be willing to <coughs> excuse me, to move to approve them as amended, but I don't know how other people feel about that. Um, you might as well make the motion and then we can discuss okay. the minutes. I move that the select board approve the select board minutes of June thirtieth, two thousand twelve, August twentieth, two thousand twelve. July and 30th. August Sorry, the first one was July. Okay. Not June. July 30th, 2012, August 20th, 2012, and August 27th, 2012, as amended. Second. Further discussion? So Ms. Stein has some amendments. They're yeah, just but uh, they're really minor, minor so. and I'll just hand them over to John. Okay. Um, I had on the ones for August 20th, uh, like two sentences got a little mixed together that I would change. It talks about... Um, that um, that I uh, summarize the process for the town manager evaluation feedback. Um, then in the next sentence it says how I tried to synthesize all of the staff and public comments into the draft composite. And of course that's not what I do. I only synthesize our right. stuff into the. So I think that the the part about the public and staff was meant to be in that first sentence about the um, about uh, summarizing the process. So. If I just move those words to the other sentence, can we consider that a, <laughs> and a <laughs> friendly amendment? A friendly amendment, yeah. And I was fine. And it, it also needs the documents list on that yes, one. Yes, I have that down. Okay. Anybody else have any issues with minutes? All right. Uh, it's been moved and seconded. Been discussed. All in favor, say aye. 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 That's unanimous. That's all I know of. Okay. We're seeing if we're got everything. I think we do have everything here. Minutes and usage are not the first. Okay, yes. So, anything else I want to tell you before we go? So, we've agreed we're not going to meet next Monday. Yay! We'll meet <laughs> instead on October 15th. We will pencil in uh, October 29th, though I will try and keep that blank if at all possible. Um, but we'll see each other the 11th. 
and we will see each other on the 11th, which is the four boards meeting in this room where we get the big projections and the updated financial trend analysis from the finance director. And I'll be here. Thank you. Unlike last year. <laughs> so uh, I apologize for not having the select board annual report done, but it is much closer, as I said. And uh, it's really fascinating to go back over the last year and be like, wow. And th the other thing that I'm finding in doing this is the various loose ends, things that have just kind of fallen through the cracks. So I'll be presenting you with a list of those <laughs> things <laughs> also. That are like, oh no. All <laughs> right. Uh, then, Mr. Hayden. I would move to adjourn. Second. Without objection, and this meeting adjourns at 9.39. Thank you very much.